Okay, so welcome everyone to the 75th lecture of Dr. Hyderi Step 1. Um, thank you for making it to today's lecture and uh, we welcome you all. Thank you for being patient while we wait for the other students to join. Before I begin the lecture, can I do a voice test and ask that you guys can hear my voice? If you guys can, can I get a yes on the chat box, please? Okay, perfect. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, did you guys have a good weekend or not? Okay, very good. Oh, okay, Dr. Grabasi, very sad to hear about that. I hope you're feeling well right now. Uh, no problem. Make sure to finish the homeworks after. Okay. Um, everyone else, were you able to do the homeworks that we asked you to do for microbiology till now? From today, we are going to finish virology today. We're going to begin with influenza virus in a while. Before we do that, I just want to make sure that you guys did your homework. Everyone, were you able to do your homework? So in terms of uh, doing the revision, I was thinking that we could do the revision at the after the end of the class. Um, since we only have two more weeks to finish our session with the first batch, how about we begin full on with um, our lecture with first aid right now and do the revision after. Hopefully by the end of today's lecture, we can do some questions. Okay, perfect. So let me just share the screen real quick and let's begin with today's lecture without wasting any more time. Okay. Can you guys see my screen over here? Are we going to are we going to cover all pharma today? By pharma, do you mean the end do you mean the antimicrobials? antimicrobials. Pharma meaning general pharmacology in one day? Is, is that what you mean or which one do you mean? If you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask me the question. Antimicrobials, yes, we will try to make sure that we fin uh, that we begin antimicrobials, at least by today. I'm not sure if we will be able to finish it or not. Okay. Okay, so with that being said, we, <coughs> we are going to finish uh, virology today for sure. That's a given. So are we ready to begin? Are we ready to begin? Okay, perfect. So we are going to start talking about paramyxo viruses. Okay. So uh, we are going to start talking about paramyxo viruses. And before we start into this uh, beginning of the discussion of paramyxovirus, at first, let's get the breakdown of the virus first in terms of DNA or RNA, positive strand, single strand, and the whole process. Okay, so first of all, paramyxovirus. Is it a DNA virus or is it an RNA virus? Paramyxoviruses, are, are they DNA virus or are they RNA? They are RNA viruses. Okay, good. Then? 
uh, if they are RNA virus, are they single, are they single stranded or, or, or double stranded? They are single stranded, very good. Are they a positive strand or are they a negative strand? They are negative stranded, very good. Then are they segmented or not segmented? Not segmented, okay, good. Do they have a helical capsid or an icosahedral capsid? They have a helical capsid, okay, good. How many viruses are there in the paravixovirus? How many viruses are there in the paravixovirus? Measles, mumps, rubella. Sorry, measles, mumps, respiratory syncytial virus, and human meta pneumovirus. Okay. Para influenza, measles, mumps, respiratory syncytial, and, and human meta pneumovirus. That's five. That's all four. So all together, we have five. Okay. So that's that. Okay, so now let's begin with the lecture. Before we begin, one more question, uh, my, my apologies. That is, the way that we just broke down the virus, are we all clear and clear and confident that that is how um, the questions are going to be asked? And when they ask you, for example, for example, if they ask you a question that you have a, a, a virus, which is an RNA, RNA is positive stranded, RNA positive, single strand, okay, helical capsid causing um, bumps or causing an induration against the second molar tooth on the, I mean, against the 12th molar tooth on the buccal mucosa, okay, I indentation or some sort of a swelling against the 12th molar tooth on the buccal mucosa. Do you guys have any idea which virus I'm talking about? And what is the name of the lesion which I'm talking about? Coptic spot. Very good. Well, so we are talking about the Coptic spot. So if the, if this is how they try to describe the virus in the question stem of step one, are we confident enough that we can identify the right virus or the right organism? Even in the case of bacteria, if that's how they do it, Right, they tell you the properties of the bacteria and they ask you to identify the bacteria. Are you going to be able to do the proper identification? I want to know this from everyone, please. Everyone, yes or no? We, it will only take a second before I begin. Everyone, are we going to be able to identify the organism based on the identification properties mentioned in the question stem? Yes, okay, good, perfect. Okay, so let's begin with paramyxoviruses. Paramyxoviruses, they cause, a, they cause disease in children. They include those that cause para-influenza, measles, mumps, respiratory syncytial virus, and human meta virus. okay. Um, Dr. K-W-A-M-Z, um, which, uh, would, would you be kind enough to let me know your name or your email address because I do not seem to recognize you? Uh, medical medic. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. So, welcome. Very good. Um, do we have everyone we need? Okay, good. Yes. Okay. So, para influenza, measles, mumps, respiratory syncytial virus, and human meta virus, which causes respiratory tract infection. So, respiratory syncytial virus is responsible for causing mainly bronchiolitis and secondary pneumonia in children. And this is what you need to underline. So first of all, I need you guys to underline the, the viruses for paramyxo, that is para, influenza, measles, mild respiratory syncytial, and human metanemovirus. So be, uh, before you guys said it was four viruses, but it's actually five viruses, so don't forget that. Now the next one is, um, this one is very high yield, that they all contain F protein, which causes respiratory epithelial cells to fuse and form multi-nucleated giant cells. This is, their, this is their pathological mechanism, mechanism of causing pathology. That is, they have a surface protein which call, that allows the respiratory epithelial cells to fuse and form multi-nucleated giant cells. The parivizumab, this is the name of 
a monoclonal antibody, which we studied before in, in the immunological drugs, that it's a monoclonal antibody, which works against the F protein, especially in respiratory syncytial virus. So palivizumab, okay, is used in respiratory syncytial infection, and this is extremely high yield. They will ask you this question in step one. That is, first of all, if you can know the name palivizumab, that is very good. And then the mechanism of action is they will target the F protein. And as a result, the virus will not be able to bind to the respiratory epithelial cells and form the multinucleated giant cells. So that's what they do. So we do this as a profile axis in young patients. A profile axis for patients who are at risk for having bronchiolitis, we prescribe palivizumab, okay? Especially in first world countries, we do that. I'm not sure uh, about the third world countries, but in the first world countries, we prescribe palivizumab. Okay, next one. Next one is let's move on to acute laryngotracheobronchitis, also called croup. Croup is caused by parainfluenza virus. Okay. Okay. Croup uh, is basically it it has a very um, harsh sounding cough, which has a very which which has a barking cough over here, and they have an inspiratory strider. Inspiratory strider basically means um, inspiratory strider basically means that. When we um, take a deep breath in, okay, the airways they kind of close up, and when the air goes down, it causes a it it, it causes a very high pitched sound. So that's inspiratory strider. The reason for inspiratory the reason for the fact that there is a high pitched sound when air goes in, it's because there is narrowing of the upper trachea and subglottis, and the reason for the narrowing of upper trachea and subglottis is due to can, then, can anyone tell me why there is narrowing of the upper trachea and subglottis in acute laryngotracheal bronchitis? Edema, very good. That's, that's, the ex, that's the exact word which I wanted to hear, is swelling, edema, and inflammation, right, as a result. So you have the inflammatory signs. As a result, what happens is they kind of close down, and when they take a deep breath in, there is a high pitch sound. And this hybrid sound, it leads to a stipple sign, as we can see over here, this, this sign over here, okay? This looks like a stipple sign, like a stipple. Uh, a stipple is basically a sharp object, okay? So this looks like a sharp object, as you can see over here, this is a sharp object. So that's that. Severe croup can result in pulses paradoxus, secondary to upper airway obstruction. Does anyone know what pulses paradoxus is? What is pulses paradoxus? I'm pretty sure you guys know what pulses paradoxus is. What is pulses paradoxus? Very good. Decrease in decrease in blood pressure less than ten during inspiration. Mm, right during inspiration. Okay. What's the normal amount by which the blood pressure can decrease during inspiration? So how much should the blood pressure decrease in, an, in a pathology of pulses paradoxes? Okay. What are the other cases where, where pulses paradoxes happens? What are the other causes of pulses paradoxes? Does, it, does anyone know what, is, what are the other causes of pulses paradoxes? Very good. COPD, asthma, and cardiac tamponade. Okay, COPD, asthma, cardiac tamponade, and now you also have acute laryngotracheobronchitis. So that's that. <clears throat> okay, okay. Uh, I, I think I believe we skipped out on rubella virus, so let's talk about this for one second before we move forward. So that's all for acute laryngotracheobronchitis. Before uh, we do that, I, I wanted to ask you another sign. So over here, you can see a stipple sign. Do you guys remember seeing a thumb sign? Thumb sign like this, where do we see thumb sign? Thumb sign on x-ray for little children. Epiglottitis, very good. Which organism is responsible for causing acute epiglottitis? Hemophilus influenza. <laughs> Hemophilus influenza. So so the, um, the, just, just for a small reason, so that we don't forget about that, can we just please write this down over here that Hemophilus influenza Okay, we'll get a thumb sign on x-ray and for para-influenza, 
for para influenza, we are going to get a stipple sign. Stipple. Okay, hemophilus influenza, we will get a thumb sign, and for para influenza, we will get a stipple sign. Okay. Let's read the rubella virus for one second. Rubella virus, if you have to describe the rubella virus, which group of viruses do they belong to? Rubella virus. Rubella virus. Which group of viruses do they belong to? Toga virus. What are the other viruses that belong to Toga virus? What are the other viruses that belong to Toga virus? Right, very good. Chicken guinea is also there. Okay. Toga virus, are they a DNA virus or an RNA virus? Fast, fast answers, please. Are they a DNA virus or are they an RNA virus? They are an RNA virus. Are they positive strand or negative stranded? Positive strand, very good. Are they single strand or double stranded? Single stranded. Are they, uh, do they have a helical capsid or an icosahedral capsid? Icosahedral capsid. Okay. So, rubella virus, it's a toga virus which can cause rubella, also known as German measles. That is, it is very high yield that to understand that they cause fever, posterior or auricular, and lymphadenopathy. So if, if there is any child with fever and lymphadenopathy over here that is behind the ears, posterior, post auricular lymphadenopathy, along with that, if they have arthalgia and maculopapular rash, the rash that we are talking about over here, it starts on the face and then it moves to the trunk. So it starts from the face and then it moves all the way to the trunk. What's the name of the disease where you have the rash that starts on the trunk and moves to the face? What's the name of the disease where you have rashes that starts on the face, that starts on the trunk and moves to the face? And anyone else with a better answer? Typhoid fever, there we go. Rose spot, rose spot rash on the abdomen starts from first on the, um, starts first on the abdomen and then it moves to the face more or less. So that's, that's more classical. Roseola infantum is also there to some extent, but typhoid is more high yield. Okay, so, so these are fine maculopapular rash that starts on the face and spreads centrifugally to inform the trunk. So if they are moving from the face to the trunk, they are known as centrifugal movement. If they're moving from the trunk to the face, it's known as centripedal movement. Okay, so you guys can write it down over here for uh, your question purposes. That is face to trunk, face to trunk rash movement. This is centrifugal and trunk to face rash movement. This is centripetal, centripetal, P-E-T-A-L, centripetal. They cause mild disease in, uh, they cause mild disease in children, okay? And, it, the, and they are a cause for causing congenital diseases. For example, TORCH disease. TORCH stands for toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes infection. So TORCH infection. Congenital rubella findings include blueberry muffin appearance due to dermal extramedullary hematopoiesis. These types of appearance where they would, they, these are blueberry rash-like appearance, okay? Blueberry muffin appearance. If you can go to Google and write down blueberry muffin on child, then this is what they will look like. That they would, they would look like um, small spots of blues on their face, okay? So this blueberry muffin-like appearance, this is due to the extramedullary hematopoiesis that happens in rubella infection, so that's that, okay? So that is rubella virus, okay? Once again, okay, is everyone hearing my voice? I have to say something very, very important. Everyone, okay. One of the most important things that I'm going to tell you right now is understanding the properties of the organism is 80% of the question, 80%, okay? If you guys can, if you guys can master the properties of the organisms, whether it be a virus, bacteria, fungi, or a parasite, right? If you can, if you can master the properties, that is 80 to 90%. It does not even matter what the rest of the question will tell you, as long as you have, you have mastered the properties of the 
organism. So please keep that in mind. Whenever you guys are doing your revision with microbiology, it's extremely possible to do the revision in one day. I'm going to tell you how. The, re the way you can revise microbiology in one day is only learn the properties of the organism. That's it. Which for bacteria, learn the tables, gram positives, gram negatives, right? And then the spirochetic table. Then you always have your zoonotic organisms for which you can learn physio. You can use physio. Then you then learn about the mycologies, that is, which one is responsible for causing this, the systemic fungi, which are the opportunistic fungi, which are granuloma producing fungi, which are the fungi with the narrow septate wide branch and this and that. That's the properties of the fungi. Then for viruses, learn about the DNAs and RNAs. And if you can do that, it will only take four to five hours or even less than that, two to three hours, you can revise the entire microbiology. So that's the best advice I can give you, okay? Next one is measles. Let's start with measles over here. So German measles is a three-day infection. Measles over here is it's called rubiola, okay? Its usual presentation is basically the, the patients will have fever, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. So fever, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis are like your big, basic uh, viral infection um, sort of a presentation. And for most of the viral infection, also do not forget that in clinical features, the patients will complain of um, periorbital pain or uh, pain behind the eyes or so or something like that, okay? Now, in measles, we have this characteristic find finding known as coplic spot, this spot over here, okay? These are coplic spot, okay, bright red spots. Uh, with a blue-white center on the buccal mucosa, especially more or less op opposite the um, this, uh, second molar tooth. So over here, on op opposite the second molar tooth, you have this sort of a presentation, followed by one to two days by a maculopapular rash. So you have a, the coptic spot. And then after one to two, two days of having this, you have the maculopapular rash. Okay, so that's that. But basically, once again, the presentations are going to be that of paramyxovirus. So nothing to be worried about. Over here, what we are trying to look at, what we are trying to look for is the complex spot. If they mention that it's measles 100%, and also they put some high emphasis on the four C's of measles. That is, the patients will have cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, and then complex spot, row C instead of K, for which will help you to remember, okay? Lymphadenitis with warten findelkai uh, giant cells. This is high yield, warten, Findelkai giant cells in a background of paracortical hyperplegia. So basically, you have uh, it's in, it's a viral infection. In viral infection, the lymphocytic um, the lymphocytic uh, response is way higher than uh, bacterial infection. So what you will have is you will basically have lymphocytes which will um, be, which will be activated and they will fuse together to form some sort of an accumulation. And this is this accumulation results in looking like a giant cell, very similar to the one which we see in granulomas. This giant cell is known as warten Findelkai giant cell. The pos okay, I'm just gonna put a high star mark over here for the fact that they can mention this in NBME, okay? Possible sequelae is subacute. Sequelae are basically the consequences of the infection. If that's not controlled then, what we can get is subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis, which will be characterized by personality changes, dementia, and autonomic dysfunction and death. So basically, the child, if it was a playful child previously, the child will now be very bothered and disturbed all the time. That the child will have small actions of dementia, okay, and the child will have autonomic dysfunction, and and then that will be death. Okay. The number one way that USMLE asks you a question about subacute subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis is by two things. That is, they focus on personality change and they focus on autonomic dysfunction. Okay, if you have autonomic dysfunctions, then you will have problems of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So uh, the clinical features can range from anywhere from urinary to bowel dysfunctions, right? And because those are our number one autonomic functioning organ, uh, organs, then, they, then um, your pupillary changes will also be there. Then sweating would also be an, an, an issue. Then cardiac dysfunctions are also there. So you really have to figure out uh, the autonomic dysfunctions because the clinical features for autonomic dysfunctions can vary a lot. Next one is, next, next one is encephalitis. is encephalitis and all can also happen. And we all know the signs and symptoms of encephalitis, right? It's fever, 
fever, headache, seizures, right? So those, so that's that. Another one is giant cell pneumonia. This giant cell that they're talking about is known as, uh, these are the Warth and Finlokai giant cells, okay? So that's that. The treatment for vitamin A, I mean, the treatment for measles is that we prescribe the patient retinol or vitamin A, and they reduce the mortality and morbidity. And the fact that we prescribe retinol or vitamin A in measles is very widely asked. So I'm just gonna put three stars over here. And pneumonia is the most common cause of death of measles associated death in children. Now, okay, pneumonia is the most common cause of that. Another thing which they don't talk about over here is uh, the number one complication of measles, which I really think they should mention in first aid is, okay, do we have Dr. Hassan with us today, Dr. Hassan? Dr. Hassan, do we have Dr. Hassan? Okay, we'll put it the number one cause of measles, uh, not the number one complication of measles, as you have studied before in community medicine. Tuberculosis is not the right answer. The number one cause, the number one complication, not the cause, the number one complication of measles. Measles, the number one complications of measles. Does anyone know the number one complications of measles? Pneumonia is there, is the number one cause of death, but it's not the number one complication of measles. Do you guys remember measles? Okay, no problem. Measles, nope. Measles associated diarrhea. Write this down. Measles associated diarrhea. Okay, this is the number one complication of measles. Every other people, every other um, patient who have, who have been infected with measles will have measles associated diarrhea and you will have multiple questions where they will have the mentions of diarrhea with measles and you really have to connect those two dots together because um, measles associated diarrhea is one of the most common complication. It, it's not a very morbid complication, meaning that people won't die from the diarrhea that happens in measles, but it's very common. The most common cause of death in measles is pneumonia. So that's that, okay? So these are the two things. They should really mention this over here. I really don't know why they don't do that. Next one is mums virus, another paramyxovirus. This is uncommon due to effectiveness of the MMR, basically meaning that you won't see a lot of mums patient over here in the uh, United States because everyone is more or less vaccinated until and unless it's a child of parents who do not believe in who do not believe in vaccine, then that's another one. So basically, mums is basically by, um, by bilateral by, bilateral parotid gland enlargement and bilateral uh, more or less lymphadenopathy, right? Bilateral local lymphadenopathy and parotitis. So people over here they have parotitis. Okay, so if we have parotitis every time you eat or drink. Uh, you will have pain in your, um, in, you will have pain in this region because the parotid gland, when they would try to secrete, then they would cause the release of um, prostaglandins and all the other mediators that are the mediators of pain and they will cause pain. So you have parotitis, then you can also get orchitis. Orchitis is inflammation of the testis. Aseptic meningitis is over there. And, and one of the most common one is pancreatitis. Don't forget this. Mom's patients, they have a high risk of having pancreatitis. Okay, if you don't treat mom's patient uh, very soon, then you 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 will get ster sterility. Why? Because the orchitis is happening over there, and we know that if orchitis, if that's not treated, then then with fibrosis, they can get sterile. They will not be traveling of the sperm all the way from the seminal vesicles to the urethra, and that will cause sterility because of fibrosis. So mom's make your parotid glands and testes uh, as big as pom poms, basically. Pom pom stands for parotitis, orchitis, meningitis and uh, pancreatitis, so that's that, okay? Not very high yield, but high yield at the same time, meaning that I'm pretty sure you guys already know mom, so I'm not gonna talk anymore about this. I'm just gonna move on to rabies, okay? okay. Now, let's start talking about rabies. Rabies, what's the family name? What is the family name of rabies? What is the family name of rabies? Rhabdovirity, very good. Rabies, is it an RNA virus or, an RNA, or a DNA virus? Fast answers, I need fast answers from you guys to see where we stand in terms of confidence. RNA, obviously, because we're studying RNA viruses. 
are they single stranded or double stranded single stranded are they are they a positive strand or are they a negative strand they are negative stranded are they do, do they have an icosahedral capsid or a, or a helical capsid okay very good helical capsid the fact that you guys are giving up this answer do you guys do you guys remember the mnemonic for helical capsids a b c d e f pro yes or no oh yes okay good okay next one is are they segmented or not segmented are they segmented or not segmented fast answers please not segmented okay very good rabies rabies are basically these are bullet shaped they, these are bullet shaped viruses these viruses they are shaped like a bullet as you can see over here the negri bodies they have the cytoplasmic inclusions the negri bodies over here so over here you find one type of inclusion bodies in the cytoplasm right these inclusion bodies are negri bodies they are commonly found in the purkinje cells of the cerebellum and the hippocampal neurons purkinje cells of cerebellum and hippocampal neurons, and that's one of the very common locations for Negri bodies. The rabies have long incubation period, weeks to months before symptom onset. Post exposure profile excess, meaning that rabies basically over here, for example, in third world countries, we, ex we expect rabies to happen from bites of dogs or, uh, any, or because they are the most common rabid uh, animals or expected to be rabid animals in third world countries. Over here, uh, dog and cat bites or dog scratches or cat scratches are not considered to be very rabid. One of the most rabid um, things that we can, that we have to deal with as physicians over here is raccoon, skunk bites, and bat. Okay, so bat, raccoon, and skunk. So these are the three animals which we expect to be rabid over here in the United States. So that's that, okay. So rabies, they have a long incubation period before the symptom onset. Post-exposure profile is after the patients have been bitten, the first thing that they need to, they, the first things that have to be done is the wounded area should be washed vigorously with uh, soap and water and then pour as much water as possible to prevent the organism from entering the, uh, from preventing the organism to, to enter the body. After that, after wound cleaning, okay, what we do is we provide RBID, meaning rabies immunoglobulin, to fight effectively before the onset of the uh, antibodies by the vaccines. Okay, so we give the e immunization with killed vaccine and rabies immunoglobulin. So if they ask which one do we give first, the answer is immunoglobulin is at first, then we provide immunization. So that's that. The mechanism of the pathology is that the rabies virus they will tra they will travel to the CNS. So the traveling of the CNS will be retrograde fashion, retrograde fashion, meaning that via dynein arms, that is, they will travel from the bite all the way to the central nervous system. Does anyone know the name of any organism which can travel anterograde? Does anyone know the name of an organism which can travel anterograde? Which one? Herpes will not travel anterograde. Which one which uses kinin? Anterograde travels. Okay. Can you guys hear my voice? Everyone? Well, okay, so how about this anterograde viruses? How about we discuss it because we have a lot of different, we have a lot of different students saying a lot of different names. Okay, for now let's focus on the retrograde then we'll talk about the anterograde, okay. So the thing is the, the reason why I underlined the retrograde fashion via dynein arms is because you have this exact same question in NBME, 
that they will talk about a patient with a rabies infection. Okay, they will talk about a patient with a rabies infection. And um, they will ask you that this virus is traveling all the way from the side of the wound to the central nervous system. And it's a retrograde transport. If it's a retrograde transport, which of the which of the following proteins are they using to get transported? And the answer is dynamic. So don't forget that. Okay. So keen to go out, dying to come back. Dying to come back, meaning dying in arms. They will travel up the nerve axons and then bind to the acetylcholine receptors. Okay. Now the problem is if they bind to the acetylcholine receptors, the rabies people, uh, the rabies patients, they will have diseases. That is, they will have agitation. Then they will have photophobia. Okay, hydrophobia. By hydrophobia, meaning that they will have painful esophageal spasm. So every time they drink, they will have extremely painful esophageal spasm. So they will be very, very afraid to drink or uh, drink water or eat food. So they will have hydrophobia, photophobia, okay, hypersalivation, right? They will have extreme, extreme salivation. And the cause of that is paralysis and coma, okay? And if it's a full-blown rabies infection, that is, we could not prevent the rabies from happening, uh, by the vaccination or cleaning of the wound, then death is, um, the mortality rate is very, very high. So that's that. Infections are more common with bat, raccoon, and skunk bites and uh, than from dog bites in the United States. So we have, to, we have to remember this, that because they test you that you have a lot of patients. So you have a lot of questions where they tell you that, that there's a patient who comes with a dog bite. And whenever they say dog bite, uh, especially us, especially our students, including me, I, I immediately thought it was rabies virus or rabies infection. But we have to remember that over here, dogs, dogs are kept um, very, very clean. They are, they, are, they are not allowed to roam freely on the street, right? But they do not do the very same thing for raccoon and skunks. So uh, dog bites are not that dangerous over here for rabies, it's raccoon and skunk. Okay, next one. Ebola virus. Ebola virus. What is the family name for Ebola virus? Fast answers, please. What is the family name for Ebola virus? Philo very very good. Philo, philo, philo very. Okay. Are there RNA virus or are there are there uh, DNA virus? They are an RNA virus. Are they a, are they a single strand or are they a double stranded virus? Single stranded virus. Are they a positive strand or are they a negative strand? Very good. Okay. Now, next one is: Are they icosahedral or are they helical? Helical. Very good. They are helical. Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, Ebola virus, it's a phylovirus that targets the endothelial cells, phagocytes, hepatocytes. So these are the three cells that they will target. That is, they will target the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, phagocytes, and, hepo and hepatocytes. Following an incubation period of up to 21 days, they will present an abrupt onset of flu, diarrhea, vomiting, high fever, myalgia. And they can progress to full-on disseminated intervascular coagulation or DIC. Okay. Over here, the problem over here is the patients that they the patients will pass away from disseminated intervascular coagulation or hemorrhage. They basically it's a hemorrhagic sort of a fever. It's a hemorrhagic fever and shock. Okay. Uh, if you ask me how many questions will I receive from Ebola virus, the answer is not many. I'm going to tell you why. That's because they like to ask you more questions, which are more commonly seen in a hospital uh, setting. Uh, Ebola, if there is any patient who has been diagnosed with Ebola virus in your hospital and is your patient, that has to be, um, that has to be mentioned to the CDC as soon as possible. And the, patients, and the patient will have to be quarantined along with the physician who was attending the patient because it's an extremely highly contagious virus and this can give rise to epidemic within a snap of a finger. So that's that. So not many questions will be received from Ebola virus, except that they can say that there is a virus with the helical capsid, single-stranded, RNA, uh, RNA, and it's a negative, it's a negative strand. 
okay? They will. They might ask you the name that is the diagnosis that to see if you can diagnose the virus, to see if you have proper knowledge of what the virus is, then that's how they can ask you. Another one is this diagnosis is done under the basis of RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase, polymerase chain reaction. Does anyone know why we do RT-PCR and not PCR over here instead in the Ebola virus? RT-PCR. Anyone? <clears throat> because it's RNA, yes, you are correct. Okay, because it's an RNA virus. Okay, is, is, is that a simple question or not? Is that a simple question? Yes, it's very simple, but a lot of students make a lot of mistakes with this. They, they cannot really realize why we do the RT-PCR instead of the PCR. So the very simple answer is it's, um, it's, it's because it's an RNA virus and we need to reverse transcribe the mRNA first and before we can transcribe into protein synthesis. And so that's that. So that's why we do RT-PCR. It's a high yield NBME question. Why do we do RT-PCR? Okay, next one. Next one is transmission requires direct contact with bodily fluids, fomites bats or primates, and high incidence of nosocomial infection is also, it's, all, it's already there. The support, uh, the treatment over here is basically, you do not have any specific treatment. You only have to give supportive treatment. That is, you have to maintain ABCDs, airway, right? ABCDs, does anyone know the ABCDs? Airway, then B4, B4, B4 what? Breathing, very good, C4, circulation. D4. D4. Degupitus, not disability. D4. Degupitus. Okay. Okay. Next one. S supportive care is there. Then there is no definitive treatment. Strict isolation of infected individuals and barrier practices for healthcare workers are key to preventing transmission. So we have to basically go in front of the patients wearing a personal protective equipment or a PPE. And that's how that, that's how we have to go in front of those patients. Next one, next one is Zika virus. Zika virus, Which, what sort of a virus is a Zika virus? What sort of a virus is Zika virus? Flavivirus. virus, Flavivirus. virus. Okay, are they an RNA or are they a DNA virus? RNA virus. Okay, are they single strand or double strand? Single stranded. Okay. Are they positive or negative? Fast answers, please. They are positive. Okay. Do you guys remember retroviral toga party and flavored Corona uh, hippie pickles flavored for flabby? Okay. What are the names? What are the mnemonic for the for the flabby virus names? The names of the flabby viruses. What, what, what is the mnemonic? What is the mnemonic for the flabby viruses? High density Zika West. What are the names of the viruses? So 
Zika virus. It's a it's a Flavi virus. The most common the most common thing that Zika virus the the most common presentation of Zika virus is congenital microcephaly. Okay, so first and foremost, before we begin, I need you to underline this because they will use fever microcephaly for um, your identification of Zika virus. It's a Flavi virus, most <clears throat> commonly transmitted by Aedes mosquito. They cause conjunctivitis, fever low grade, and rash. So rash, fever, conjunctivitis. Fever, rash, and conjunctivitis is very common for viral infections, but not a lot of viruses will cause these signs symptoms and microcephaly. So if they cause microcephaly in uh, young children or, uh, or recently delivered babies, then the, the mother had a congenital Zika virus infection, or they can also cause miscarriage. Over here, once again, we have to diagnose our, we have to diagnose it with RT-PCR or serology. If I say we have to diagnose with RT-PCR, if I have to do, if I have to ask you something, which, what does RT-PCR detect? Which part of the virus does the RT-PCR detect? Very good. RT-PCR will detect mRNA. Okay, do not forget this. Sexual and vertical transmissions are possible. The outbreaks are more common in tropical and subtropical climates. Do they have supportive care? Basically, no specific treatment over here. There's only definitive care. There's no definitive care, only supportive care, okay? Now, before we begin hepatitis and uh, HIV, once again, retrograde viruses, what are the names of the retrograde virus? First of all, we learned one over here. That is, we learned about rabies. Another one is anterograde. Anterograde, they will use the kinin arms. And uh, Dr. Hassam said herpes, okay? Her herpes or um, HPV, which one? Which one is a, which one is an anterograde virus? Herpes, okay. Does anyone know the name of any other virus except herpes? Okay, so basically the herpes virus, they stay dormant in the ganglions, right? For different types of H HSVs, we have um, different types of herpes, which will stay dormant in different types of ganglion. And when there's flaring of the viruses, that virus will travel anterograde by the kinin arms all the way to the periphery, and then they will cause the disease. So uh, uh, previously, I, I was just a little bit confused about herpes and uh, polio, but um, the answer is actually herpes. So Dr. Osam, thank you so much for mentioning this. Okay, so and so write this so write this down over here because this is a high yield question. So you have anterograde, grade, which is herpes. Commonly, it's herpes for USMLE step one. Okay, commonly it's herpes for USMLE step one. Yes, her, herpes can do both. That is, they can go both go anterograde and red and and retrograde. But if herpes, if they travel retrograde, will they be causing the disease? Yes or no? No, so that's why herpes will travel anterograde to cause the disease. Okay, they will be born. Okay. Hello? Yes, can you guys just give me one minute, please? Yes, it is.
yes, my apologies. So, um, anterograde is herpes because if herpes, if they travel retrograde, then they will remain dormant and they will not cause the disease. Okay. And rabies virus, if they travel retrograde, okay, if they, if they travel retrograde, that is from the bite of the wound to um, the central nervous system, then they will cause they will cause the rabies infection. Okay, so for retrograde, it's rabies. For anterograde, it's herpes. Okay, herpes, and I also want to say polio to some extent. Okay, that polio virus because they will also travel anterograde. But uh, unfortunately, um, the confusion which I was facing was uh, I was just a little bit confused that whether USMLE likes to make questions about polio or herpes, and I just checked it, and um, it's herpes that they make more questions about instead of polio. So let's focus on uh, herpes for anterograde and rabies for retrograde, okay? So that's that. Now, let's start talking about hepatitis viruses. Okay, hepatitis virus. Are we all ready to begin our discussion with hepatitis? Hepatitis? Are we all ready to begin our discussion with hepatitis? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so hepatitis viruses, they have, we have hepatitis A, B, C, D, E. Do we have hepatitis F? Hepatitis F? Okay, good. So uh, let's, uh, let's start talking about the hepatitis virus. First of all, hepatitis, they, that basically meaning that hepatitis are the viruses that will go and infect the hepatocytes, okay? That will go and infect the hepatocytes. We all know what, which viruses do which things, first of all, if I have to talk about fecal oral transmitted transmitted viruses that will cause uh, fever, jaundice, diarrhea <clears throat> to some extent, right? And uh, nausea, vomiting, which, which two viruses am I talking about? Which two viruses am I talking about? Fever, jaundice, hepatitis A and hepatitis E, very good. If I, I'm talking about uh, two hepatitis viruses that will cause fever, acute liver failure, Sign uh, and they may progress to he hepatic cirrhosis or hepatic carcinoma. Which two viruses am I talking about? Hepatitis B and hepatitis C, very good. If I'm talking about a hepatitis virus that can co-infect only when there is complementation, which, which type of virus am I talking about? Hepatitis B, okay, hepatitis D, okay. Now, hepatitis A, which family of viruses do they belong to, hepatitis A? P. coronavirus, very good. So with P. corona, we, we had perch, right? With perch, the last word H in perch is hepatitis A. Okay. okay. What, are the, what are the other names of perch viruses? Perch. Polio, entero or eco, which one? <clears throat> then R4, fast answers please, R4. Very good, C4. Okay, and H4, HAV, very good. If I have to talk about hepatitis B, which family do they belong to? <clears throat> hepatinovirus, very good. They belong to hepatinovirus. Okay, another one is if I, if I have to talk about um, hepatitis C, which family do they belong to? We just talked about this, flavivirus, very good. H, hepatitis D is delta virus. We, we have not discussed about as much. And hepatitis E virus, which family do they belong to? Hepatitis E virus, E. Hepatitis E belongs to hepi virus. Do you guys remember hepi virus? Where did we learn hepi virus? Hep E virus. Right, so that's hepatitis viruses over there. Okay, now 
the before I begin my discussion and we go to the table, there's one thing which I want to talk about. <clears throat> okay. So um, I want to talk about this. Okay. So if you guys want, you guys can also do this. First of all, I want to tell you exactly how the liver looks like in different types of hepatitis virus. So first is gross appearance. Okay. First one is gross appearance. Next one. Next one is which type of inflammatory cells? Inflammatory cells are there. <clears throat> and another one is what type of? Another one is what type of um, cytoplasmic inclusions or bodies, or if there's anything that we can see accumulating. So instead of bodies, I'm gonna write write this accumulations in the liver, okay? So we are talking about the gross description, inflammatory cells and accumulations in the hepatocytes in different types of hepatitis infection, okay? So the first hepatitis virus that I'm gonna talk about is <clears throat> hepatitis A virus. Hepatitis A virus and gross appearance, the liver will appear to be swollen. So the liver will be appearing to have to be swollen, that it's a hepatic, um, that it's, um, Swollen liver, basically, the on abdominal on on physical examination, when you inspect the abdomen, the hepatocytes will be palpable. I mean, the liver will be palpable. The inflammatory cells that we find over here, this inflammatory cells, these are monocytes. Okay, these are monocytes. So basically, macrophages are the primary inflammatory cells, and accumulations in accumulations we find. Councilman bodies. This is how I need you to learn the hepatocytes, how they look like in different sorts of hepatitis infection, because this is a very high yield piece of information that we will find over here. I'm not making this up. It's the last part of this one, liver biopsy, right? What do we find when we try to inspect the liver? So I'm just trying to break these things down into easier form because everything else in this table is very easy to understand except this one. So instead of memorizing it, I just want you to break it down like this instead in gross appearance, inflammatory cells and accumulation. Next one, next one, next one is B, hepatitis B. On gross appearance in histology, okay, they will, they will have a ground glass appearance. Okay, they will have a ground glass appearance. Okay, the inflammatory cells over here are cytotoxic T cells cytotoxic T cells and eosinophils and eosinophil. And on accumulation over here, um, the accumulations are basically granular eosinophilic accumulations. So granular, I'm just gonna write granular over here. So basically they will look they're, they're, they will look like there are small pieces of granules in the cytoplasm. So that's how hepatitis B would look like. Hepatitis C on the other hand, it's very easy to understand. Hepatitis C has um, hepatitis C over here have macrophagic, I mean macrovesicular. Okay, so they will be swollen. Okay, just want to make sure if I'm saying the right thing or not. Give me one second. Right, macrovesicular. Okay, so macrovesicular steatosis, meaning that they will have hepatocytes, hepatocytes filled with more or less lipids. So macrovesicular vesicles filled with lipids, macrovesicular steatosis. There is no accumulation over here. And the number one inflammatory cell is lymphocytes. Okay, the number one inflammatory cell is lymphocytes. Okay, next one is hepatitis E. Hepatitis E, we won't see any inflammatory cells over here. Okay, no... Um, the accumulations and over here on the only thing that we would see is patchy necrosis okay the only thing that we would see is patchy necrosis were you guys able to write this down and um so you have this small piece of you have the space over here this would be a very good space to write this down didn't you guys write this down <clears throat> so that it's easy for you because um this is one of the most important things from the table from where the questions are going to come. Yes, okay. 
repeat. I will repeat it again when we do the table. I just need you guys to write it down first. Did you guys write it down? I will repeat it either ways because we have to do the table. That's when I will repeat it. But did you guys write this piece of note down? Yes or no? If you guys didn't, then I'm going to give you guys some more time or else I'm going to move forward. Okay, so hepatitis, the sign symptoms of all hepatitis virus are, you have fever, jaundice, and alanine aminotransferase and aspirate aminotransferase, ALT and AST will be very high, fourfold to fivefold higher. These are naked viruses, meaning that they are not enveloped. They lack an envelope and are not destroyed by the gut. Okay, so they are not destroyed by the acidic environment of the gut. So hepatitis D, HBV, DNA polymerase, Okay, HBV, once again, it's a hepatinovirus, meaning it's a DNA virus. They have a DNA polymerase, has a DNA and RNA dependent activities. Upon entry into the nucleus, the, the polymerase completes the partial, over here, it's a partial double-stranded DNA. It's not a full double-stranded DNA. It's a partial double-stranded DNA. So they have to complete the full process of forming a complete double strand. So when they enter, the partial double-stranded DNA is completed to form a full, um, full, full double strand by the help of the polymerase enzyme. The host RNA polymerase will transcribe the mRNA from the DNA to make viral proteins. And then the DNA polymerase then reverse transcribes the viral RNA to DNA, which is the genome of the progeny virus. So it's a very easy thing what's happening. First of all, let's say that this is the cell over here. First of all, it's the hepatitis B virus it comes and it enters the cell, it's not, it's a partial double strand. So over here, this part is missing. With the help of the polymerase, this one is converted to, this one is converted to full double strand. Okay, now this full double stranded DNA, now the host mRNA can transcribe the viral proteins from over here. And at the same time, after the viral proteins are transcribed, um, the polymerase will convert this one back to this one. And that's how they will, they will multiply. And then once again, this one will be converted to this one and then more mRNAs and proteins will be made. And that's how the virus keeps on causing damage. So that's what happens. The hepatitis C will lack the three prime to three prime, uh, three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. So there will be no proofreading abilities. As a result, there are so many antigenic variations of HCV and envelope protein. So basically this is the reason why um, infectivity, why there's a question in NBME that is why is HCV more infective than hepatitis B? Hepatitis B, it's easy to mount an immune response against hepatitis B because hepatitis B, they have three prime to five prime exonucleus activity. So there are proofreading abilities in hepatitis B for which there is no antigenic variation in hepatitis B. So antibodies can easily form and they can mount an immune response. But hepatitis C, since they lack three prime to five prime exonucleus activity, they have several antigens. Okay, they have antigenic variations of the envelope. And as a result, when you produce one sort of antibody, they will not go and act on the antigen. So antibodies have to be produced uh, on a multiple basis. So the host antibody production will lag behind or lags behind the production of new mutant strains of HCV. Okay, so that's, so very similar to HIV infection, but then again, HIV is more repetitive, has more antigenic variation than hepatitis C. Okay, but hepatitis C is more infective because they lack three prime to five prime exonucleus activity. Are you guys with me? Did, didn't you guys put a star mark over here? Friend DME? Everyone, do I have everyone's attention? Do I have everyone's attention? Dr. Allison, Dr. M Dr. Iman, Dr. Evi, Dr. Janar, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Lala, okay, Dr. Hassan, okay. Yes, what is your question? Dr. Hassan, what is your question? Yes, I'll unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Yes. They, they mentioned that the hepatitis B also have uh, the reverse transcriptase, yes? Yes. So, so what is the importance, like, 
Hepatitis D has DNA and RNA dependent activities. They have a polymerase, not a, not a, not a transcriptase. Ah, okay. Okay, it's a polymerase enzyme. It's not a transcriptase enzyme. Okay. Any other question? Dr. Rasam, no? Yes, no? Okay. Okay, so now let's look at the table. First of all, hepatitis A is a, it's a picornavirus. D is a hepatina, C is flavi, D is delta, and E is hepi. We already learned about this. Let's talk about transmission. Fecal oral, you guys said A and E, right? And for hepatitis A, the fact that shellfish is fecal oral, this is extremely high yield because they will use this in question stems. They will tell you that you have a patient with fever jaundice with a history of having shellfish. When they mention shellfish, they are mentioning hepatitis A. If it's, um, if it's um, a perinatal, that is a pregnant woman with uh, jaundice and fevers for step one, it's um, hepatitis D is there. But if it's a perinatal hepatitis infection, meaning that fever jaundice, then it's hepatitis E. Okay, so, don't, so don't forget this. They're more common in pregnant women's hepatitis E virus infection. Hepatitis B and C, they have the same mechanism of uh, route of infection that is parenteral, that is via blood transfusion, right? Or sexual. The same thing is over here, but uh, prim primarily is blood more than bodily fluids. Incubation period for hepatitis B and C is long. And for hepatitis D, it has to be a super infection. So that's not very high yield. And for A and E, it's short. So if these two have a short incubation period. These two have a long incubation period. Okay. Now, um, okay. if I ask you a question, that is, you have a young surgeon who is doing an operation. And during the operation, um, there is a prick of the glove and there is blood from the surgeon's hand, which gets mixed with the blood of the patient he is operating on. Now he is not sure that the patient has hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or HIV. If the patient were to have hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, which of the following viruses will have the highest yield of causing the primary infection? Hepatitis B, C, or HIV? Very good. Hepatitis B. Why, why is the answer hepatitis B and why is the answer not HIV? Why is the answer hepatitis B and why is the answer not HIV? No. The answer is viral load. Okay, viral load. For hepatitis B, a, a small amount of virus is enough to cause the infection. That is, the viral load is very low. And for hep HIV, the viral load is very high. That is, you need a considerable amount of the virus to cause the infection, okay? This is an NBME question. So the answer is viral load. Now, let's, let's talk about the clinical course. Clinical course, first of all, we know what happens. It's acute, it's self-limiting. That is, if you have... Uh, Hepatitis A infection, they will self-limit if you have symptomatic uh, treatments, right? Maintenance of fluid, resuscitation, making sure the patient eats, they're making sure the patient is comfortable in a comfortable decubitus, and this and that. Hepatitis B, they have serum sickness-like presentation, that is fever, rash, arthalgia, okay? And um, <clears throat> hepatitis C has more possibility to um, result in hepatic cirrhosis or hepatic carcinoma. The prognosis is very good for hepatitis A. For hepatitis E, the prognosis is good, but if it happens in a pregnant woman, like I just mentioned over here, the mortality rate is very, very high. So hepatitis E for pregnant woman is not good, okay? Hepatitis C is, it becomes stable, but it has a high possibility of remaining dormant and causing chronic hepatitis and carcinoma and cirrhosis. Hepatitis B, on the other hand, if you try to resolve it, uh, they can have full resolution, okay? And um, they can be, uh, they, they, um, the resolution percentage is actually close to around 
85% of the patients will get. Okay, so the, they, they ask you a question about this in uh, US Assembly step one in the U world, that is what would happen to a patient if they have been infected with hepatitis B? And majority of the student, they write over there chronic hepatitis, and that's the wrong answer. Always write, uh, the, or always choose the answer which says that the patient will be okay, okay? That the, that the infection will be gone away because the percentage of resolution is 85%. So complete resolution is the right answer. Hepatitis C risk, once again, it's high. I mean, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma risk is high in hepatitis B and C, and we know this. And then again, we studied the liver biopsy, right? This one, because I, I wasn't getting a lot of feedback from you guys when I asked you whether you guys wrote this down or not. Did, didn't you guys write this down? Everyone, okay. Because majority of the questions are going to come from over here, guys. Majority of the questions especially difficult questions are going to come from over here. Okay, how does, so what, so basically they will ask you questions, right? They will tell you that you have a, a patient with, um, they will they will not tell you the signs symptoms. They will tell you that you have a patient with on liver histology, there is hepatic swelling and councilman bodies. Which of the following viruses have the possibility of causing the infection? That this is the sort of pre, uh, question that they might ask you. Okay, hepatic swelling and councilman bodies, it's high yield for hepatitis A, so that should be your answer. If they mention patchy necrosis, it's hepatitis E. If they mention ground glass appearance, it's hepatitis B. And if they mention macrovascular steatosis, it's hepatitis C. So you have to focus accordingly. Carrier state. Hepatitis A has no carrier state. B and C carrier state is very common over here, so they could be carriers. Enteric and epidemic, but they do not have carriers. So hepatitis E does not have any carrier state, okay? Okay, now this one. This is what I want you to focus on for hepatitis D, the last thing, that is hepatitis B, HB, SAG will quote for viral entry into the hepatocyte. So there is a very high yield question in USMB step one, uh, that is the U world. They ask you, how does hepatitis B help hepatitis D cause the infection by helping in which stage of the pathogen, which stage of the pathogenesis. Hepatitis B will help cause hepatitis D in the stage of viral entry, in the stage of viral entry. That, that, that is hepatitis B virus will help the hepatitis D virus to enter by helping them code it out. So this is this is very high yield. So put your stomach over here and expect to see this question in U world, okay? Now, let's talk about hepatitis uh, A, B, and C complications or extra hepatic manifestations. Hepatitis B virus, okay, hepatitis B, the complications are A, P, M, okay, APM, APM for, APM for aplastic anemia, P for polyarthritis lorosa, aplastic anemia, P4, polyarthritis nodosa, N4, membranous, glomerulonephritis. Membranous, mem glomerulonephritis, that's more common over here, okay? Now let's start talking about the hepatitis C man uh, manifestations. Okay, let's talk about hepatitis C manifestations over here. Hepatitis C manifestation, first of all, um, let's talk about skin, okay? Let's talk about skin over here. In skin, we can find two things. First of all, in skin we have, okay, are you guys drawing this with me or am I the only one who's drawing this? Okay, in skin we have lichen planus, write down LP, lichen planus, and PCT for porphyria cutanea tarda. Okay, so that's for skin. Okay, now, if we have, okay, if we have, for example, adrenals and pancreas, right? So pancreas and adrenal, they will help you remember endocrino endocrinological abnormalities. For endocrine, you have two things for hepatitis C patients. That is, they have diabetes mellitus and hypothyroid, okay? diabetes mellitus and hypothyroid. 
diabetes mellitus and hypothyroid. Another one is um, over here, uh, you have another one that is vascular. Okay, for, for vascular, you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay, so we won't just, just one second. One second, give me one second. Okay. For vascular, you have A, B, C. You have the ABCs and you have, you have LI, okay. A, B, C for A for autoimmune hemolytic anemia, B, B for B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, C for cryoglobinemia, Okay, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, B cell non Hodgkin's lymphoma, cryoglobinemia, L4, leukocytoplastic vasculitis, and I4 ITP. Okay, so these are the vascular manifestations. Did you write this down? Yes or no? Did you write this down? Can you guys hear my voice? Did you guys write this down? Yes or no? Need some feedbacks from you guys so that I can move on or not move on. Okay. So hepatitis, you have APM. Hepatitis B or hepatitis C, you have all of these ones, which, you, which I just mentioned. Okay. So you have membrane or proliferative to membranous glomerulonephritis. That's, that's more common. Okay. Then you have leukocytoplastic vasculitis. Then endocrinological, you have diabetes mellitus and autoimmune, right? Uh, for vascular, you have ABC, LI, ABC4, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, cryoglobinemia, uh, B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma, ITP, and leukocytoplastic vasculitis. <clears throat> Okay, are we clear? Can we move on to hepatitis serologies? Can we move on to hepatitis serologies? So once again, are you guys supposed to, um, last week we asked you guys to only read microbiology. From this week onwards, can you guys start doing the questions of microbiology? Yes or no? Yes, okay, good, okay, now. Let us start talking about hepatitis um, hepatitis B virus, okay? So I wanna talk about hepatitis B virus. First of all, hepatitis B virus, uh, it's a partially double-stranded DNA virus, okay? So, and the, and the coating of the virus is that the, this virus, they have, um, uh, they have a normal eicosahedral capsid and a normal viral envelope. So, so what we do is, first of all, the first thing that I wanna draw is our first thing I want to draw is I want to draw two DNA polymerase. Okay, I want to draw these two things as the DNA polymerase. Then the next thing that I want to draw is I want to draw the partial strand, double stranded DNA. Okay, so if I have to draw a partial double stranded, it should be something like this. Okay, so it's partial double stranded. Then the next thing that I want to draw is the capsid. Okay, and then the next thing that I want to draw is the surface antigens or the envelope of the virus. So if I have to identify this, then this is DNA. Um, yes, this is DNA polymerase. Okay, this is the 
partial double stranded DNA. Okay, and now let's start talking about the antigens. First of all, the number one antigen is surface antigen, so HBS AG, and then we have and we have um, E antigen over here. Okay, we have these E antigens like proteins in the middle between the envelope and the capsid. So that is H B E A G. Another one is we have these antigens over here on the capsid. So it's capsid antigen for H B H B C A G. Okay, so these are the three things. Now, by looking at the antigenic levels of HBS, HBE, and HBC, we can make a very good deduction that whether we are dealing with an acute hepatitis B infection, a chronic hepatitis B infection, or whether the patient has had any vaccinations or have the patient recovered from a past infection. So basically, before we do that, we have to understand at which period, which level of which antigen is rising. So first of all, when a, when a virus infects uh, the liver, okay, such as the hepatitis B virus, when they infect the liver, the first, <clears throat> the first antigen that rises, I wanna talk about is the HBSAG. That is the HBSAG, they rise, okay, for, uh, for around uh, one to three days, right? And then what happens is that they fall very rapidly. After they fall very rapidly, okay, the next thing that rises, the next thing that rises over here, so this shows, um, okay, this, this, this shows the fall, and then the next thing that rises over here is anti-HBS. So if I label them properly, the first antigen that rises very rapidly is HBSAG, and then they also fall very rapidly, okay, this is anti-HBS, anti-HBS, okay. So right now, patients who are in this timeline, that is this one over here, when the HBS AG is down and anti-HBS is not formed properly, if is there a possibility that patients in this timeline, they can get away with hepatitis B virus infection? That is, we cannot detect the hepatitis B virus if we look for HBS AG only, yes or no? Yes. What is this what is this period called? I'm pretty sure every one of you know this name, the name of this period. Very good. Window period. This 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 one is known as window period. Okay. To de to detect if a patient is in a window period or not. For example, there is a patient with fever, jaundice, liver inflammations and all signs symptoms of hepatitis, that is they also have, have aplastic anemia, polyarthritis, right? So, but the HBS AG is not showing as positive. So to make sure that the patient is not in a window period, the test that we can do is the antigen HB, for example, HBC AG, this antigen that is when HBC AG, when they enter the body, the antibody, the first antibody that is made against hepatitis B is anti-HBC. Anti-HBC is the first antibody. So first you have the entry of the organism and this is the period when your body fights off the virus and it detects the first antigen that is HBC AG. And instead of letting this antigen rise, it starts producing the antibody right away, okay? and they mount an immune response and the anti-HBC stays high. So over here in the window period, if we have to detect, if we have to detect, for example, the patients have sign symptoms of hepatitis B, but HBSAG is negative. To confirm that if the patient is not in a window period, we will do anti-HBC. We will do anti-HBC. Next one. The next one that I wanna talk about is E. Uh, the way I would like to remember is E is for infectivity, okay? E for infectivity. Basically, HBEAG will very subtly start rising from over here and then they will fall, okay? And whenever they fall, the next thing that will give rise 
or that will start happening is antibody formation. Okay, so you will have anti HBE. Okay, anti HBE. Now, one might ask, um, why do we not do anti HBE to check if the patients have? I mean, if the patients are in a window period or not, okay? Is that a legitimate question? Yes or no? Why do we not do anti-HBE to see if the patients are in a window period or not? Is that a, is that a legitimate question or it's a, is that a bizarre question? That's a legitimate question. The reason being is because anti-HBE, the level of anti-HBE detection, okay, in the window period, this is not up to the mark, basically meaning that uh, anti-HBE levels are not very uh, specific, although they are highly sensitive, but they are not specific, okay? They have a low specificity, okay? They have a low specificity and yes, low predictive value. And also the fact that anti-HBE level is does not rise very high as anti-HBC does in order to detect an abnormality. So that's so that is the answer. So that's what's happening over here. Very simply put, HBAs AG will rise for a couple of uh, days to months, and then it will fall. And anti HBS will form. The first antibody to produce will be anti HBC, which will stay high, and anti HBE will be E for infectivity. Now, if we take another of this cami blank pages, okay, one second. Okay. So let me draw this again. Okay. Okay. Let me draw this again. So you have HBS and anti HBS. Then you have anti HBC and you have HBE and anti HBE. Okay. Now let's just talk about the, all the different types of. Uh, presentations. For example, if it's an acute one that is in this stage of the infection, what are the antibodies that we can, I mean, what are the serum findings of acute hepatitis B? What are the serum findings? First of all, let me, okay. It's very easy to say which things will be positive, which things will not be positive. What are the findings in acute hepatitis B? Over here, which one, which ones are positive? HBSAG, and then which one? Then, fast answers please, which one will be positive? And HBEAG. Okay, now let's start talking about chronic hepatitis B, chronic. Which one will be positive in chronic? HBSAG. HBSAG, will it be IgM or IgG in chronic? In chronic, it will be IgG, right? In chronic, it's IgG. How about an acute one? IgM. Okay. How about HbEAG? If it's a chronic hepatitis B and the infectivity is very high, what would happen? Fast answers, please. If it's a chronic hepatitis B and HBE is very high and, and, and infectivity is high, what would happen to HBE? HBE AG will be high. Okay, so this is chronic with high infectivity. If I have to uh, write another one that is chronic with low infectivity, okay? Chronic with low infectivity. Is HBS AG still going to be there, IgG? Yes or no? Fast answers. I need some fast answers, please. Yes, very good. Next one is, will HBEAG will be there? 
will edge be EAG be there if it's low infectivity? Will HBE AG be there in low infectivity? Fast answers, please. HBE AG, no. If HBE AG is not there in low infectivity, what will be there in low infectivity? What will be there in low infectivity? Anti HBE. Okay, I need you guys to be more confident and more faster. Anti HBE. Okay. How how about window period? Let's talk about window period. What are the two findings of window period? First of all, anti HBE. Will it be positive or negative in window period? Anti HBE. Positive. So, anti HBE is there. How about anti HBC? Very good, anti-HBC, okay. Okay, if I have to talk about a patient who received a vaccination, vaccination, what will be positive? Vaccination. If, if it's a vaccinated patient, will they have, um, will they have, um, HBE or, or anti HBE or HBC, yes or no? If it's a immunized patient, will they have HBE, anti HBE or anti HBC? Yes or no? No, okay, good. So the only thing that will be positive is anti-HBS. Okay, and another one. Another one is if it's a patient who recovered from a past infection, will they have anti-HBS? Yes or no? Yes, will they have anti-HBZ and anti-HBE? That will also be a positive. Okay, so that's that. So as you can see over here, one second. Do you guys realize that in first aid, you do not have the um, anti-HBC markers anti or anti-HBC findings? Okay, so if you guys want, you guys can uh, write this down. You guys can write the ones which I just wrote down over there in your first aid and that will help you. Okay. One second. Okay. So this is the table which I wanted to talk about. Okay. There is no mention of anti HBC um, over here as much right so anti hbc they they say it's igm igm igg igg but they're not very specific about which ones um about in which stage we find them that is in i, I want you to focus that over here that anti hbc is more common for window period and anti hbc is absent in immunized one okay now Anti-HAV is the one, for example, if there is a patient with an acute hepatitis A infection, we find eight IgM antibodies. If it's a patient with past infection, we, we will find IgG antibodies, as simple as that. So HAV, IgM for primary infection, HAV, IgG for previous infection or vaccinations. HBS, AG will, will be found, it will, it will indicate a hepatitis B infection. Once again, if HBS, AG, if we find HBS AG with um, I with um, anti HBC IgG, it's a chronic infection. If we find HBS AG with an anti HBC IgM, it's a acute infection. Okay, 
Next one. Next one is anti-HPS. It's an antibody to hepatitis B uh, anti antigen. This will indicate immunity either due to vaccination or from a previous um, infection. HBC will, will more or less always be there. Always focus on IgMs or IgG. But uh, what I said before when anti-HBC was not there is that I didn't is, is that they did not really focus on the fact that anti-HBC is used more or less to um, diagnose the window period. Okay, so anti-HBE is also used, but anti-HBC is more common. So that's that. HBC AG antigen detection with the core of hepatitis B virus. That is the capsid protein over here. Okay, the core antigen. Next one is um, anti-HBC, it is the antibody to hepatitis B. If it's an IgM, it's an acute. If it's an IgG, it's a prior infection. That, that. HBE is secreted by the infected hepatocytes, not part of mature HBV virion. The fact that HBE AG is secreted by infected hepatocyte, this is a question from NBME, okay? That is, which antigen is secreted from infected hepatocytes? A lot of students write HBS AG, but the answer is HBE AG. Okay, it's secreted from infected hepatocytes and it's not a part of the mature hepatitis B variant. Indicates active viral replication and therefore high transmissibility. Okay. Anti HBE is antibody to hepatitis B, HBE AG, and this indicates low transmissibility and also it indicates the window period. Okay, so that's that. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Hepatitis virus, are we clear about hepatitis virus? Can I get some feedback from you guys? Were you guys with me when I was talking about hepatitis B virus? Are we clear? Do you guys have any question? Can I get some feedbacks? Okay, why are you guys uh, less responsive today? It's the starting of the week. We are supposed to be in a very good mood and is, is everyone on the same page? Do you guys have any confusion? You can clear it out. Okay, good. So the next one is HIV. How important is HIV? Okay, HIV. HIV is very, very, very important. And HIV, if we have to talk about HIV, do you guys realize that HIV have, if you can look at the structure of HIV, that is they have GP41, GP120, P17, P24, and each one of them, for example, you have ENV, GAG, uh, poles, and they will transcribe for different types of um, proteins, yes or no? Okay. So the fact that we have to remember every type of protein or every type of gene that would, that was that is responsible for um, the HIV viruses, we have to learn this and this has to be stayed in our mind perfectly. And one of the best ways to do this is to look at the video from Physio, where that is the picture mnemonic for HIV. Uh, before starting our lecture on microbiology, I was very specific. I told you guys I will not use Physio for all the organisms, except the ones that I think is a very, very high yield. And I personally believe that Physio has done a very good job at trying to mention all the important stuffs about HIV in their picture mnemonic. So I think it's very important that for if we have to watch any video from Physio for microorganisms, HIV virus is the one to go for, okay? So are we all ready to begin the Picture mnemonic for HIV before we jump into the lecture, yes or no? Okay, is anyone, can anyone take a picture of HIV? Wait, where is HIV? There we go. Okay, so it's a big one, okay? After we watch the video, we will go for our break. Uh, what I will do is I will increase the timing so that we make sure that uh, we don't, okay? So that we make sure that we don't get the time. Do I increase the timing or do I not increase the timing?
Welcome to section 14 of viruses. This is our virus overview figure. In this video, we'll be discussing human. Okay. So what are the things that will be covered by physio over here? First of all, they will talk about, um, okay. First of all, they will talk about the virus in general. Then they will talk about all the different types of capsid proteins, how to remember them, how to associate them. And the last thing is, the best part about this video is they will, they will, the best part about this video is they will mention the treatment for HIV altogether. That is in which stage we have to give which drug. And remembering the drugs of HIV, are they difficult or not, not, not difficult? Remembering which drug we prescribe in HIV, are they difficult or not difficult? Everyone? Huh? Is there any one of us who find it easy to remember the drugs of HIV? I personally couldn't. Okay. So the thing is, they, we have to use different sorts of drugs in different sorts of um, st stages of HIV. And this video will help you identify all the different types of drugs that we can use in different stages of HIV. So that's why it's a big uh, of a lengthier video. Okay. Now, the thing is, do I increase the timing or um, do I keep it at the same rate. Anyone? It's almost like I'm talking to myself today. Okay. Increase the timing. Two times. Okay. Well, I'll increase this to 1.25 seconds. Okay, let's do this. Okay, are we ready? Who is responsible for taking the picture for HIV? Okay, we can keep the farm apart for when we study it. But who is responsible for taking the picture for HIV? We will not uh, read the pharma portion, no problem. Who is responsible for taking the picture for HIV? Okay, Dr. Emmes, let's do this. Yeah, that will be our focus. We know this video is long, but it will be worth its weight in gold because HIV is one of the most important pathogens to be familiar with for step one. So buckle down and let's dominate this beast. Before we get into the image mnemonic, let's take a step back and understand HIV from a conceptual standpoint first. As you can see, this is an image of the structure of HIV. Notice that it has two copies of linear RNA. So it has a diploid linear RNA genome. Surrounding the genome is a cone-shaped capsid, and the proteins that make up the capsid are also known as P24. Outside of the capsid, you can see that it's surrounded by matrix proteins, which are also known as P17. Finally, outside of this, the entire virus is surrounded by a lipid envelope. On the surface of the virus, you can see two glycoproteins, a docking glycoprotein known as GP120 and a transmembrane glycoprotein known as GP41. We'll talk more about the function of these in a second. Next, notice that there are several key enzymes that the virus makes, including reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. Finally, if you look at the box to the right, you can see that each of these proteins or enzymes are encoded for by three genes. The M gene encodes for GP120 and GP41. The GAG gene encodes for P24 and P17. And the pole gene encodes for reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. If you're feeling overwhelmed right now about all this detail, don't be. The image mnemonic we'll go through in a minute will make this a cakewalk. I just want you to visually appreciate how complicated HIV is and have this picture in the back of your mind as you memorize these details. All right, now that you understand the structure of HIV, let's move on to discuss the replication cycle. When a patient is exposed to HIV through bodily fluids, such as blood or sexual exposure, the virus infects T cells and macrophages. So notice that HIV uses GP120 to interact with the CD4 receptors. Most of the time, when you think of CD4 receptors, you think of T cells, but macrophages also have CD4 receptors. This is why you can see that GP120 also interacts with the co-receptor CCR5 if it's infecting a macrophage, but it may also interact with CXCR4 if it's infecting a T cell. Finally, GP41 
acts as an anchoring protein that is inserted into the host cell membrane, which allows the virus to fuse with and gain entry into the cell. So you can see that we've shown the virus entering the cell via endocytosis. From here, the virus releases its contents and reverse transcriptase converts the viral RNA into double-stranded viral DNA. Next, the virus uses integrase to insert the viral DNA into the host DNA. Once this occurs, the host cell transcribes the DNA into RNA, which is then translated into a polyprotein. This large polyprotein is cleaved by protease, and then a new HIV virus is assembled, which goes on to infect other cells, and the process begins again. All right, now that you understand the structure and mechanism by which HIV causes disease, let's memorize these details. This scene will take place in a fantasy world where an evil witch rules the land. She's had many recent battles, which have resulted in many wounds on her arms. So if you look closely, you can see that she's covered up with wounds with band-aids. This is our symbol for AIDS, and the virus responsible for AIDS which is HIV. Notice that we've included many warm red and orange colors, which should help you remember that HIV is an RNA virus. Now we've shown a dwarf who is in bondage to the witch, and he's manning a pulley to a well in order to provide water for the witch and her forces. Pulleys work by someone exerting a force in one direction, which then causes the pail of water to move in the opposite direction. In other words, it moves in a retrograde fashion relative to the force. So we'll be using a pulley to represent retroviruses, and HIV is a member of the retrovirus family. Retroviruses have the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which allows the virus to convert its RNA into DNA, which can then be integrated into the host's genome. If you look closely at the ropes in the well, you can see that there is one red rope emerging from the well, and then after the pulley, it splits into two blue ropes. The single red rope represents RNA, and the two blue ropes represent DNA. So this should help you remember that the enzyme reverse transcriptase converts a single strand of viral RNA into double-stranded DNA. Next, notice that we've added a rainbow to the scene, which should help you remember that HIV is a positive sense virus. Now we've added an army of soldiers next to the witch. You can see that they're in a line and walking over to the wall. This line of soldiers should help you remember that HIV has a linear RNA genome. Now you can see that we've shown a mirror on the wall. The witch frequently asks the mirror, who is the fairest in all the land? To which the mirror usually responds that she is. However, recently she learned that she is no longer the fairest of them all and that there is a new beautiful princess who is prettier than she is. Now she's pretty envious and upset, so she sent her army into the magical mirror which teleports them to the castle of this beautiful princess. You can see that her army is swarming the place in search of this new beautiful princess. Anyway, a mirror normally creates a reflection of an existing image, so you could say that it creates a copy of whatever it's looking at. Therefore, the mirror should help you remember that HIV has a diploid genome, or two copies of RNA. Now we've added several more characters to the scene inside of the witch's prison cell. Let's zoom up so you can see this better. Notice that the witch's soldiers have trapped this dwarf and his wife. Now they're torturing him in an attempt to get him to tell them where this new beautiful princess is. If you look closely at his hand, you can see that the dwarf is holding a cone with some ice cream that he was eating before he was captured. Anyway, the cone is here to help you remember that HIV has a cone-shaped capsid. The fact that he is getting gagged by a soldier should make you think of the gag gene. If you look closely at his other hand, you can see that he's holding a sundial, which measures 24 hours in a day. This should help you think of P24, which is another name for the proteins that form the cone-shaped capsid. So, dwarf getting gagged with a cone and a sundial for gag gene, cone-shaped capsid, and P24. The gag gene also encodes for the proteins that form the matrix, and these are known as P17. To help you remember this, we've shown a wizard that's casting a spell on these soldiers in an attempt to protect this poor dwarf. You can see him lifting up his wand and casting a complicated spell with many numbers, most of which are the number 17. All of the numbers shown this way look kind of like the Matrix from the Matrix movie. So the wizard casting a Matrix spell should make you think of the Matrix. The number 17 should help you remember P17, and the gagging dwarf should help you remember the gag gene. So all these ideas together should help you remember that the gag gene encodes for the Matrix, which is formed by proteins known as P17. If we return to this image, you can see that GAG encodes for P24 and P17. P24 are the capsid proteins that form the cone-shaped capsid, and P17 are the matrix proteins that form the matrix. All right, now notice that we've added several metal poles adjacent to the well. The poles are our symbol for the pole gene, and the pulley is our symbol for reverse transcriptase. So together, these ideas should help you remember that the pole gene encodes for reverse transcriptase. Now we've shown some scissors on the rope that's coming out of the well. The dwarf uses these to trim the ropes as he's pulling water out. In any case, the scissors represent a protease because protease enzymes cleave other enzymes, just like scissors cut paper. Because this is next to the metal poles, 
you should be able to easily recall that the pole gene also encodes for aspartate protease. Finally, we've shown another dwarf next to the poles that's tying ropes together. This is a symbol for integrase because integrase essentially tethers the viral genome to the host genome, just like this dwarf is tethering two ropes together. So this is here to help you remember that the pole gene encodes for integrase. If we return to this image, you can see that pole encodes for reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. You can also see these enzymes inside of the virus right here. Now you can see that we've added the word envious to the witch's dress. Obviously she is pretty envious because she is starting this war over the fact that she's not the fairest in all of the land. But we've also added this word on her shirt to reinforce this idea. In any case, the word envious sounds like M, which should help you remember the M gene. This gene encodes for GP160, which then becomes GP120 and GP41. To help you remember this idea, we've shown a large group of 160 soldiers moving away from the witch and then splitting into two groups inside of the mirror, a group of 120 soldiers and 41 soldiers. The largest group of approximately 160 soldiers represents GP160. The smaller group of 120 soldiers right here represent GP120, and the smallest group of 41 soldiers right here represent GP41. So the fact that the group of 160 soldiers is splitting into two smaller groups should help you remember that the M gene encodes for GP160, which then becomes GP120 and GP41. If we zoom up on the mirror, you can see that the soldiers have coordinated this attack quite well and have signs that help the soldiers know where to go. The larger group of 120 soldiers is flanking the building from the side, and the smaller group of 41 soldiers is breaking down the entrance with the battering ram. So again, GP160 is cleaved to form GP120 and GP41. Notice that the group of 41 soldiers is using a battering ram, which is allowing them to enter the building, just like GP41 allows the virus to enter the cell. So this should help you remember that GP41 is associated with viral fusion and entry into the host cell. You can also see that the group of 120 soldiers on the left side of the image are climbing up the ladder and pulling off a servant helper guy with the number four on his shirt. The four on his shirt should help you remember the CD4 receptor on T helper cells. So together, these ideas should help you remember that GP120 binds to CD4 receptors. If we return to this image, you can see that the M gene encodes for GP120 and GP41. GP120 is the docking glycoprotein and GP41 is the transmembrane glycoprotein. Now we've added a red letter on the witch's dress. If we zoom up, you can see that it's the letter S. This scarlet S is our symbol for sexual transmission and should help you remember that HIV is sexually transmitted. All right, now let's talk about how the virus enters the cell. To help you remember this information, we've shown a girl being attacked by the witch's army. If we zoom up, you can see that she's holding a T-shaped flail, which is our... Okay, so let's stop the video over here for one second. Okay, let's see whether you have learned um... The things which we were which were mentioned until now, Dr. Ms. You don't have to take the picture yet. I will tell you when to take the picture. First of all, let's see if you guys have learned the three structural genes. First of all, E and V. What does it quote for? E and V. What does E and V quote for? GP one twenty and GP one sixty or GP one twenty and GP forty one. Okay, so. The envious witch, right? For the two one. Okay, now what does gag quote for? Gag. G A G. What does gag quote for? P24 and P17. Very good. Very, very proud of you guys. Good job. Next one is POL. What does POL quote for? reverse transcriptase and integrase. Okay, uh, okay, once, okay, I'm gonna ask you guys once again and fast answers. ENV, what does ENV quote for? Once again, GP12041, very good. Fast answers, GAG, what does GAG quote for? GAG, gag. Okay, what does POL, poll quote for? Very good. Um, now, capsid and matrix proteins. Which P's are the capsid and matrix proteins? Okay. Which ones are the? Okay. So okay. So that's 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 that. 
Now, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, in order to save time, I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the video up to here because my goal of the video was to make sure that you guys know properly which ENV, GAG and poll which it quote, quotes for. So Dr. MS, if you have to take a picture, please take a picture of this one. Are you done? Dr. MS. Okay, good. Perfect. Okay, so we are going to keep the video up to here for now. And uh, later, if we need to understand anything else, we would um, start the video again, especially during the pharma portion, we will watch the video once again. But for now, we will keep this up to here and we will go back to our discussion. Okay, now, so we will be talking about the HIV virus. First of all, HIV virus, uh, if we want to talk about this, HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus causing acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, that is AIDS. So, and now the thing is that I want to talk about the structures of the virus and everything. Just give me one second. My computer is acting up. One second. Just give me one second. Okay. Now, HIV virus, is it a DNA virus or is it an RNA virus? HIV, is it a DNA or an RNA virus? RNA virus, how many molecules of RNA does HIV have? Two molecules of RNA, okay. Now, HIV, does it have an envelope or it does not have an envelope? It has an envelope, okay. So let's first draw the two so these are the two strands of RNA. This is not a DNA, this is the two strand of RNA. And if it's a two strand of RNA, then over here, we have the reverse transcriptase. Okay, over here, we have the reverse transcriptase. Then the next one is we have the capsid, capsid with the capsid protein. If it's a capsid protein, what is the P number for this one? P what? Fast answers. 24, very good. Okay, so this is the capsid protein, that is the P24. Then right outside of the cap of the capsid protein, we have the matrix protein. So all the layers, okay, the matrix protein is P17. I'm just gonna write this over here, okay. And outside of the matrix protein, we have the envelope. Okay, we have the envelope. And in the envelope, we have two types of glycoprotein. Okay, that is, one is GP41. Another one is GP120. Okay, this is a lipid or lipid envelope. So that's that. Now, uh, if they have this, then the genes for HIV, which we have just read, is ENV for 41 and 120, then GAG for P27 and P17, and POL for reverse transcript transcriptase, integrase, and protease. Did the physio video help understand these? informations yes or no okay now okay now another thing which i want to go uh, which i want to do before i want to um before i jump into the lecture i mean you know, before i jump into first day is i want to talk about this thing really quick that is i want to talk about hiv diagnosis okay First of all, HIV diagnosis, uh, it, we diagnose patients over here in United States that is with HIV in a step-by-step -step fashion, okay? Um, first of all, if we suspect that if a patient has HIV or not, okay, what we do is we test for two things. First of all, HIVs are, there are two types of HIV. One is HIV-1 and HIV-2. Can anyone tell me where, in which country is HIV-2 more, more prevalent? HIV-2? Africa, okay. Now, the question is from the, there's a question from NBME. That is, there's a patient who is negative for HIV-1, but has severe immunodeficiency, okay? Severe immunodeficiency, all the signs and symptoms for HIV is there, but HIV-1 is not 
positive. So, and the patient is an African American woman who is currently living in Africa. So, which, uh, what is the diagnosis of the patient? They will, they will have a lot of other immunodeficiency disorders over there. For example, they can say that this patient has skid or this patient has this and that. But do not forget that if the patient has fever, diarrhea, lymphadenopathy, and immunodeficiency like syndrome, there's a possibility that if HIV-1 is not positive, then that patient is HIV-2 positive. So we check for HIV-1, HIV-2, and we check for P24. P24 is the capsid protein. So we check for that. If it's negative, okay, if it's negative, then we can say that the patient does not have HIV. That is negative for HIV 1, 2, and P24. We think the patient does not have HIV. For example, if this becomes positive, we still have to confirm it that because we know that there are certain cases where it could be false negative. And uh, without confirming, if, if you tell a patient he or she has HIV, it's life devastating. So next thing what we do is we check for, uh, uh, I mean, over here, it's HIV 1, 2 antibodies as well, not antigen. So that's that. Okay, so the next thing that we check is we, check, we, try, we try to check for HIV 1 or 2 antibody. HIV 1 or 2 antibody. Okay, so if a patient is HIV 1 positive, so HIV 1 will be positive, then HIV 2 will be negative. If it's HIV 2 negative and HIV 1 is positive, which is majority of the patient, then we say that this patient is HIV positive. Once again, it could be HIV-2 positive, just the exact opposite, or HIV-1 negative, okay? That's that. Or another rare combination is HIV-1 and 2, both are positive, okay? HIV-1 and 2, both are positive. But over here, if all together, 1 and 2, they're both negative, then the last thing we test for, this is high yield, this is where the NBME questions are coming from. That is what would happen if HIV 1 and 2 are both negative? Do we do any further testing? That's the question. The answer is yes. What we do is we do nucleic acid amplification test. Nucleic acid amplification test. If a nucleic acid amplification test is positive, then we can finally confirm for 100% uh, for a very high percent that HIV is positive. If it's negative, then we can say that the patient does not have HIV. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Step by step, nucleic acid amplification testing. Okay. Are we clear? Okay. Give me one second. Let me just finish. Let me just get this. What is your question, Dr. Hosam? Please unmute yourself and ask me the question. Uh, yes, doctor. Yes. What is so your when they make the blood test and check antibodies, they check for one antibodies or they look for two? Two. Because HIV two. 1, HIV 2, and P24. Uh -huh. Okay. HIV 1, 2, and P24. Are we clear? Yes, you have a question, Dr. Jordan. What's your question? Use the chat box or unmute yourself, whichever you prefer. Um, my, I want to ask if the NAT test is the same that we use for chlamydia. For chlamydia, nucleic acid amplification test for chlamydia, yes, that's, that's it's the same test. Okay. I mean, it's the same procedure. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So that's that. Okay. So uh, now, yes. Doctor, can I ask one? Why we should make the nucleic acid test uh, be, if, if the antibodies is, are negative? Because sure, if the patient have HIV, he will have antibodies uh, positive, unless you mean the, the window period, yes? Nucleic acid, okay. So what if for some reason, let's say the person has HIV, but your body cannot mount a proper immune response. Is, is that a possibility? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, in that case, we uh, the patients can have both HIV-1 and 2 negative antibodies. And we just want to confirm that if uh, the body's immune system, if it's not intact, then the antibody um, load could not be very high 
to be detected in the serum. So that's why we do an amplification test to confirm finally. Yeah, or maybe if in, in early case of infection, the body is not forming antibodies yet. We yes. do not do a nucleic acid amplification test in the early uh, in the early stages of infection. We do a uh, nucleic acid test, that is this one over here. We do this after we want to see if the patient have no antibodies detected. But for some reason, this patient who is HIV-1 negative and HIV-2 negative, this patient still has the signs symptoms of HIV. So we just want to finally confirm by nucleic acid testing that whether the antibody is actually there or not there. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So that's that. Okay, you have a question. Okay, so Dr. Jordan's questions has been answered. Dr. Hossam's question has been answered. Does anyone have any other questions? So we proceed to NAT if the patient is presumed to be severely immunocompromised. No, you, you are getting this wrong. The patient will not be presumed to be severely immunocompromised. This is just a final confirmatory test to finally confirm for 100% that the patient does not have HIV. I mean, not 100%, nothing is 100%, but a very close to 100%. We just want to make sure that it's still not false, ne uh, false negative, okay? Because nucleic acid amplification test has a very small or low rate of false negativity. So we do nucleic acid amplification test. Okay, then next one. Is Sketchy Micro also good for HIV? I personally cannot answer that because I did not use Sketchy Micro uh, or Sketchy as a matter of fact. I, I, even when I was a student, I used Physio. So uh, my apologies. I, although Sketchy is very famous, so it should be good, but I have never used it. It's, it should be very similar. It should be very similar to Physio. So that's that, okay. I personally like Physio, so that's that. That's why I use physio and I ask my students to use physio too if they have to use anything. Okay, now, any other question before we begin? Okay, hopefully no one has any question. If you guys do, do not hesitate to ask me. I'm gonna begin with the lecture. Okay, so this is the drawing which we, which we discussed. You already know this, that HIV has a diploid genome. We have three structural genes. These are structural genes, ENV, GAG, and POL, which codes for all these structures. 120, 41, P24, 17, and integrase, polymerase, and transcriptase. So 120 and 41 form from the cleavage of 160. And GP120 will help you with the attachment of CD4, and GP41 will be fusion entry. I cannot even begin to stretch how important these informations are. Okay, that's, that's why I made you guys watch the video. You will be asked questions about this on a multiple, multiple basis. If not in U world, then in NBME 400%. So please do not forget to read this. Then capsid and matrix proteins are for P24 and 17 and transcriptase integrase and proteases are there. Reverse transcriptase will synthesize the double-stranded DNA from the genomic RNA. And then the double-stranded DNA will integrate into the host genome. So basically the DNA will first has to be transcribed and then, then the DNA will go and attack the genome. The virus binds CD4 as well as a co-receptor, either CCR5 on the macrophage or CXCR4 on T cells, so either one. The virus will bind to CD4 as a co-receptor or CCR5 on macrophage and CXCR4. We talked about this before in immunity, have we not? Yes or no? Do, do you guys remember talking about this previously in the immunology? Did we talk about this or not talk about this? Yeah. Now, if if the patient does not have CCR5, if the patient does not have a proper CCR5, then can uh, HIV cause the proper um, infection? Okay, so homozygous CCR5 can result in immunity, which is very rare. I've never seen anyone this one, but it's uh, more it's more of a theory than what it is. And heterozygous CCR5 will have a slower course of action, okay? We'll have a slower course of action, okay. Now, let's go for the diagnosis. Presumptive diagnosis made with HIV, one and two antigen or antibody immunoassays. These immunoassays will detect viral P24, IgG antibodies to HIV one and two. It has a very high sensitivity and specificity. Viral load test will determine the amount of viral RNA in the plasma. These are not still very high yield. Let's just read through them and I'll tell you exactly what will be asked in the questions. 
high viral load associated with poor prognosis. This makes sense. If the viral load is high, then obviously the prognosis should be low. Also use viral load to monitor an effect of drug therapy. For example, if we use, um, for example, if we want to see if the HIV is um, act if decreasing when we prescribe the patient anti-HIV medication to look for the prognosis, we will look for the viral load. Okay, so this, this is not a question, but I feel like this, is, this has the potential to be one. So please put your star mark over here. Use HIV genotyping to determine appropriate therapy. AIDS diagnosis. When do you say the patient has AIDS? AIDS is basically when the when the normal cell count of T of T cells is 500 to 1500. If it falls anywhere close to 200 or less than 200, we and the patient is HIV positive, we can say the patient has AIDS. Okay, acute immunodeficiency syndrome. So less than 200 CD4 or HIV positive with any sort of AIDS defining condition, for example, pneumocystis or cryptococcus. So that's that. Western blots test. Previously, we used to do Western blots to detect HIV, but they are no longer recommended for by the Center of Disease Control for confirming any testing. So nowadays we do antigen antibody testing in babies with suspected HIV, or we do viral load, anyone. So this is the whole process of how we do it, step-by-step, step, and how you will be doing it when you guys are done with your USMEs. okay? First of all, HIV one and two and P24, if it's positive, it's positive. Yeah, I mean, if it's negative, it's negative. If it's positive, then we would do antibodies test to see which one it is. Is it HIV one or is it HIV two? And since it was positive once, if both of them come back as negative, we just want to confirm if the patient has actually has HIV or does not have HIV. So the, for the final test, we will do NAT, nucleic acid testing to see if HIV, in it, if HIV one is there or HIV two is there, okay? Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay, okay. Next one, time course of untreated HIV infection, okay? untreated HIV infection. Let's see what happens over here. This is this sort of time coursing. This is more high yield for hepatitis B. Uh, for HIV, it's not very commonly asked, okay? But let's look at this over here, okay? Uh, I will refrain from drawing any other diagram for this one because um, this is not as high yield as hepatitis B. So let's just look at the one in first aid over here. So first of all, let's look at um, the blue line over here, the blue line will represent HIV RNA. As you can see, first of all, when HIV gains entry into the body, okay, in HIV, when they gain entry into the body, the virus will start to multiply very vigorously, okay? So this is basically, if you look at the viral load, they will start multiplying very vigorously. And then all of a sudden, okay, and then all of a sudden, um, the viral load will start to fall. Okay, the viral load will start to fall. And at the same time, when the viral load increases, the CD4 count will start decreasing. Okay, so vice versa. When they decrease, the CD4 count may increase a little bit, but eventually the CD4 count can decrease to as low as this one over here. That is less than 100. Now, the antibodies, which will be high at all times, for example, for hepatitis B, it was anti-HBC. For HIV, it's anti-envelope antibody, GP120. So this antibody will always be high in an HIV individual. So that, that. Another one is um, another one is CD8 T cells, as you can see, is just as affected as CD4. They're also decreasing, right? And if it's CD4 and CD8, now my question to you is: If you want to detect whether a person is in window period or not, is it a possibility that we can do the anti-envelope antibody test, anti-GP120? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. So keep that in mind. The dashed lines on CD4 count axis indicates moderate immunocompromise, okay? And uh, when AIDS defining illness, that is over here, 200 or less, this is when AIDS defining illness will emerge. Most patients who do not receive treatment will die of complications. The most common cause of death in HIV is respiratory infection and respiratory failure, because uh, that, that is droplet infections are one of the most easiest ways for an organism to gain entry into your body. Because you can be very careful about the type of food you eat. You can be very careful about the type of, um, uh, about the type of uh, wound punctures that could or could not happen. You can be very careful, but you cannot always be extremely careful about the type of air you breathe in. 
So droplet infections is one of the most highest yield. So that's why they said, specifically they mentioned pneumocystis because pneumocystis pneumonia is a uh, cause of, uh, AIDS divide, of AIDS pneumonia and pneumonia and respiratory failure is one of the most common cause of death in HIV. Okay, uh, okay. so looks like they have not mentioned the signs symptoms of HIV very well. First of all, who knows the signs symptoms of HIV? We have fever, diarrhea, and then with then 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 what else? Over, then, then what else do we have? Who can tell me the signs symptoms of HIV? What are the signs symptoms of HIV? No specific signs symptoms is not a correct answer. So you have fever, diarrhea. You have lymphadenopathy. Now my question is. How long are, is the fever, diarrhea, how long will, will it stay for you to realize it's HIV? Two months for what, for two months for or which one? Okay. okay, so fever, diarrhea, lymphadenopathy, weight loss, and anorexia, fever for one month, okay, right, more than one month of fever and diarrhea, so that is more generally more common, so one month of, so basically in step one in your world, the question that you will be asked is, you will have patients who comes to you with a previous history if it's an adult patient, he will have a previous history of sexual exposure, especially the questions are more directed towards a group of people that, uh, for example, USMLE UWorld uses homeless people over here as a target for the HIV population. Then they also use IV drug users, that's that, IV drug users, and children of mothers infected with HIV. So that, that's that. They will tell you that you you have a you have a patient who comes to you with history of multiple sexual exposure, where the patients were not using any barriers, or a patient with a history of multiple drug abuse, and now the patient has complained of diarrhea for more than one month and fever. So there, if they are saying something like of this sort, then they are trying very hard to paint a picture of HIV in your mind. So you have to grasp it accordingly. So that's that. Okay, four stages of infections are, are acute, latent, falling, and final crisis. That is acute HIV. Feeling fine is there, there will come a point in, uh, in the, for example, nowadays with the help of the drugs, we keep HIV, we treat them almost like diabetes. Basically, we treat them like a chronic infection. That is, we try to control the HIV. We try to do tests every three to six months check for the viral load, check for CD4 count, try to prescribe the drugs. And nowadays with the mortality of the HIV diseases have decreased a lot with the, with the emergence of uh, new medications. So nowadays uh, we try to make sure that we keep it, uh, we keep the viral load low, okay, HIV viral load. We try to keep this low so that the CD4 count stays high, but eventually the count will fall and there will be a final crisis where the CD4 count falls way below 100 and the patient will die of opportunistic infection. So that's that. Okay. Are we clear about this? Can we move on to over here? Yes. Dr. Hossam, what is your question? Can you unmute yourself and ask me the question, please? Yes, doctor. Uh, yeah. Like th these symptoms, fever and uh, diarrhea, at the beginning of infection or at the late stage when the CD comes? the beginning of the infection. At the beginning. beginning, right after he has he or she has been um, has come in contact with an HIV individual, the viral load was high. The beginning of the infection: fever, diarrhea, weight loss, lymphadenopathy, fever and diarrhea for more than one month for one to six months. That is very diagnostic of HIV. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, okay, who else? Who who needs a break? Who needs a break? Raise your hands. If you can raise your hands, I can't see because we are doing it a virtual class. Okay. Previously, I would ask you, you want to read? Okay. Okay. I know you guys need a break, but just give me five five minutes. Okay. All I need is five minutes from you guys. Okay. Just give me five minutes. I just want to mention some things. Okay.
if the CD4 count falls below 500, okay, I need you guys to remember this, okay? H, H, E, C, 500. Heck, 500. Heck, 500. Don't forget this. Heck, 500. Then, less than 200 is H, H, J, P, not E, C, J, P, 200. Okay. This sounds like a name of a software. Okay, so I know that a lot of you guys are into softwares or apps and this and that. If you can remember the names of those things, I'm pretty sure you can easily, not easily, if not a little bit difficult, but still try to remember HEC 500 and HHGP 200. And the last one that I want you to remember is this one. A, B, C, 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 E, M, T. Okay. Okay, so HEC 500, HAGP 200, and ABCCC EMT. Okay, so with that, let's see who's smart enough to realize why I'm writing these things. Why am I writing these, these things? What do these things represent? Nope. Nope. Names, right. These are the names of all the opportunistic infections that happens in AIDS, that is when the CD4 count falls below 500, you have HEC organisms. When CD4 count falls below 200, you have HHJP organisms. When the CD4 count falls below 100, you have ABCCCEMT organism, okay? It's a bit difficult, but the reason is you have to remember if not only the names of the organisms, which happens at different stages because they will have questions. For example, they will tell you, let's say that uh, the organism over here is Cryptococcus neoformans, okay? If they tell you that you have an AIDS patient with Cryptococcus neoformans, then immediately you have to assume by yourself, if the question fails to mention it, that the CD4 count must be less than 100. Am I clear? Yes or no? Okay. If they tell you that there's an AIDS patient with aspergillus infection, then you have to assume immediately the CD4 count is less than 100. Or if, if there's a patient with, uh, let's say, candida infection, then you can assume that the patient's CD4 count is at least close to 500, okay? Close to 500. If not, if the patient doesn't have any more infections except only candida, then the patient has a CD4 count of 500 or less, but not, but but nothing as little as 200 or 100. That's what you can assume for your assumptions. Okay, this piece of information, if you can master this, you can score very high in all the HIV questions because uh, they will try to make the difficult questions by asking you to make the assumption what the CD4 count is. Okay, now let's talk about the organisms before we take a break. Okay, HHEC. Very easy to understand that HHEC is HPV, HPV, then HHV8. HHV8, what, which organism is this, HHV8? I mean, it's a herpes, but which herpes infection is this, HHV8? Kaposi sarcoma, very good. Okay, E4, Epstein-Barr virus, C4, Candida, Albicans. Okay, Candida, Albicans. So before the break, we will only study 500 and 200. And then after the break, we'll come back and study 100. Okay. This one is histoplasma capsulatum. Then HIV for HIV, meaning that HIV can be detected over here. Okay. Then J4, John Cunningham virus. And P4, pneumocystis gyrovici. Okay. Okay. Let's see who has a very sharp and brilliant mind who can who can mention HEC 500 and HHJP 200. I know each and every one of you have a sharp and brilliant mind, but some of you like to hide your knowledge and uh, keep it to yourselves. So um, let's see who who is confident to mention these things right away, right by looking at this right now. Who is confident? 
who can mention the organisms HEC 500 and HAGP 200? I am very sure you guys are confident. Anyone, any anyone who is confident to mention HEC 500 and HAGP 200 can say the name and go for a break. And we can start our break. Dr. Hussam, thank you so much. Anyone else? We need another one, another student. Dr. Iman, okay. So Dr. Hussam, please unmute yourself and answer the questions. Yes, doctor. Yes. So first one, what is the question? Uh, HEC 500. What are the organisms that happen at CD4 less than 500? Um, uh, Cabusi sarcoma. HEC herbis. 500. Yes, 500. Cabusi sarcoma, yes. herbis, herbis sarcoma, A. HHV8, very good. Then next one. And E is for Epstein Barr virus and -Barr virus. very good. Then and C for Candida. C for Candida. There was another H, right? H H for ba human babyloma. Very good. HPV. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. As always, trying to help us out. I really appreciate that. Um, next one is Dr. Iman. Thank you for trying to participate. What are the organisms for less than two hundred? Uh, H H S B. H H J P. Okay. So what are the organisms for HHJP? Uh, histoplasma. Histoplasma, then? Uh, HIV. HIV. Pneumocystic gervicii. Pneumocystic gervicii, uh, another one. And JC virus. JC virus for John Cunningham virus, very good. So thank you so much. For that. So that those are the organisms for um, 500 and 200, okay? And after we come back from the break, we'll learn about the organisms for less than 100, okay? So with that being said, we are ready to take our break. How long do you guys want to take the break for? We did very well for the first two hours of our lecture today. How long do you guys want to take the break? Fifteen minutes. Anyone else with any other feedback? Okay, so 15 minutes has been, been what it is. So 15 minutes break, that's what we'll do. It's 11.30 right now, we'll come back at 11.45, okay? Let's take that break, let's come back at 11.45. Let's start with AIDS and let's finish it.
Okay, so um, is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back from the break? Can you guys hear my voice? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? If you guys are back, can I get a yes on the chat box? Okay. Dr. Adenom, Dr. Hassan, can you guys... Um, Tell me the names of the organism HEC and HAGP. HPV, HPV8, EBV, and C4. And that, what, what are the organisms for HAGP? Histoplasma, HIV, JC, very good. P4, very high yield organism, pneumocystis. Okay, P4, pneumocystis. Pneumocystis, Jirovici. Okay, good. Now, let's learn about the organisms that is less than 100. A, B, C, 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 E, M, D. Okay, basically A4, Aspergillus, B4, Bartonella, Bartonella Hensley, responsible for causing cat scratch disease. Then we have Candida once again. Okay, then we have Cytomegalovirus, Cryptococcus neoformans, E4, Epstein-Barr virus, M4, Mycobacterium, Mycobacterium, Avium, Intracellulary Complex, or MAC, and T4, Toxoplasmosis, Toxoplasma gondii. Aspergillus, Bartonella, Candida, CMV, Cryptococcus, Epstein-Barr virus, Mycobacterium, Avium, uh, Intracellulary, and Toxoplasma gondii, okay? Can, can I give you guys one minute? I'll give you guys two minutes to learn this right now not later at home. You all, you, you guys already have so uh, too much to learn at home right now, okay? I'll give you guys one, I'll give you guys two minutes. After two minutes, I will ask, I will ask Dr. Kameshwari and I will ask Dr. Um, Dr. Allison, okay? Random choice, Dr. Allison, Dr. Kameshwari, another doctor that is, I will ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, okay? I will ask Dr. Ahmed. So two minutes on the clock for three of you guys, the rest of you guys can hear the students out, okay? Two minutes. HAJP, HEC 500, and ABC EMT. It's 11.50 as of right now. I'll ask you at 11.52 exactly. Okay, Dr. Allison is not going to be there. Anyone else who can replace Dr. Allison is more than welcome to do so. At 11.52, I'll ask you guys the names of the organism. After that, I'll move on.
Okay, Dr. Kameshwari, what are the organisms for uh, HIV that will take place at less than 500? Past answers, please. Can you guys hear my voice? I do not have all day, guys. I need some feedback from you, please. If you do not want to participate, just say no. That's enough. No problem. I'll move on. Okay. Okay, Dr. Kameshwari, I cannot hear you, so I'm not going to... Okay. So we'll move on. Dr. Iman, once again, what are the organisms for HIV less than 500? Uh, it's A, B, C, C, C. No, 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 uh, for, five, for 500, heck 500. 500, uh, H, H, E, C. Yes, with that we have? Candida, Ibistin bar virus, okay. and human babyloma virus 8, and uh, human babyloma virus and herpes simplex virus 8. Very good, thank you, thank you so much. So, that, so those are the organisms. Next one, okay. Um, Okay, no problem, Dr. Kameshwari. I'll move on to another doctor. The next doctor I wanted to ask was Dr. Nusayb Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, would you be kind enough to name the organisms for 200? What, 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 what are the organisms for 200? I'll wait for three seconds. After that, I'll move on. They are H, 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 J, B. Yes, H, A, J, B. What are the organisms for H, A, J, B? IV and H for uh, histoplasma. J okay. for JSA virus and B for pneumocystis gyrovici. Pneumocystis gyrovici, very good. Okay, now who is confident to name the organisms for CD4 less than 100? CD4 less than 100. Okay, doc, Dr. Let's see who said I can, number one. Dr. Jordan. Okay, Dr. Jordan, what are the organisms for CD4 less than 100? They are A, B, C, 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 E, M, T. Yes, um, we, have. we have Aspergillus, Candida, Bartonella, um, Cytomegalovirus. Okay. Um, we have Cryptococcus. Okay. Uh, and one last is Cryptosperdum. And for E, we have, yes, for E, we have Epstein Barr virus. And um, for M, we have MAC. Okay. And for T, we have Toxo. We have T, we, for T, we have Toxo Plasma Gandhi. So thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. I really appreciate that. So those are the organisms for HIV, okay? So, okay, now the next thing is you also have to realize that just because CD4 count is 200, there is a possibility that patients will still have these organisms. If CD4 count is less than 100, there's a possibility that patients will have infections with all of these organisms, okay? So obviously <clears throat> that's that. Now, findings. Findings are very, very high yield. Because I'm pretty sure we all know what each of the what each what each of these viruses they cause. For example, candida will cause oral thrush. We know this. So presentation-wise, I'm not really worried about you guys not knowing what it causes. But finding-wise, it's very very high yield. Findings is candida. We know that they will cause white plaque, which you can which you can scrape it out. If you use a tongue scraper, you can scrape it out very easily. There will be very minimal bleeding, but it will be painless. So there will be. Scrapable white plaque with bleeding or no bleeding. If it's bleeding, then it's very minimal. Epstein Barr virus will have what's white plaque, which will be unscrapable, which will be unscrapable. We know this already, so I'm not going to put a lot of, um, I'm not going to talk about this in depth. Keposi sarcoma, we already saw this, which will cause lymphocytic infl inflammation because it's a herpes virus, so we'll do a biopsy. Histoplasma will cause, we know it high histo hides in the macrophage, so. Macrophage will find histoplasma. We know this. We're not, we won't talk about it anymore. HIV will cause cerebral atrophy. They can cause AIDS associated dementia. Then JC John Cunningham virus will cause non enhancing areas of demyelination on MRI. This is not high yield. So I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on this. So, you, so I'm not going to do that. For pneumocystis, ground glass appearance on lungs, extremely high yield. Okay, extremely, extremely high yield. Aspergillus will cause aspergilloma, which will appear as a cavitation or infiltrate. Who can tell me the histological finding of aspergilloma, of aspergillosis, narrow septing or white septing, and narrow branching or white branching? Which one? Who can tell me the aspergillus finding? Very good. Branching at 45 degree angle, so narrow branching and septed hyphae. 
if I talk about um, if I talk about wide angle branching, which organism am I talking about? Mucor. Proud of you guys. Thank you so much. So that's it. Bartonella will cause cat scratch disease or bacillary angiomatosis. It's basically biopsy with lympho lymphophilic inflammation. Biopsy, which biopsy of which tissue has to be done over here in bacillary angiomatosis? Let's see who remembers. Bartonella Hensley. What do we take a biopsy of? Lesion. Very good answer. Which lesion? Lymph. Lymph lesion. Very good. Lymph. Lymph nodes, right? We do lymph node biopsy. Candida will cause esophagitis. Candida esophagitis. Candida esophagitis and CMV esophagitis. Okay, let's look at the difference because this is high yield. And CMV esophagitis, I put an emphasis on this on the previous lecture that the ulcers will be linear ulcers. Okay, there will be linear ulcers. And over here, the ulcers are white plaques on endoscopy. There'll be cotton wool spots on, on fundoscopy for CMV retinitis. And biopsy will reveal intranuclear Alzheimer's lesion body. We already learned about this, so we'll skip this out. Cryptococcus neo neoformis will cause meningitis. This is extremely high yield because of the Indian ink stain or uh, latest agglutination test of the mucicarmine stain that we will do, okay? Encapsulated yeast or Indian ink stain. Cryptosporidium will cause acid fast oocytes oocysts in stool, acid fast oocysts. Do you guys remember the protozoal um, organisms? We had cryptosporidium. What are the two other protozoal organisms? Fast answers, please. For that are responsible for causing GI infections. Protozoal organisms, fast answers. GI dia and E4. And Taniva histolytica. Very good. Which one will cause entrovisos pus? Which one will cause anchovy sauce pus? Anchovy sauce pus of the liver. Which one will cause fatty stool and foul smelling diarrhea? Yeah, that. Epstein Barr virus, the next one, Epstein Barr virus over here when CD4 count falls below 100, Epstein Barr virus can cause primary CNS lymphoma that will appear as ring enhancing lesion, um, like the one that happens in toxoplasmosis. Okay, but the one in toxoplasma is multiple ring enhancing and the one that happens in Epstein-Barr virus may be one or solitary. So that's a difference. So, so single ring enhancing lesion in a patient with HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, write it down. Single ring enhancing lesion in HIV on MRI in the brain. It's Epstein-Barr virus for primary CNS lymphoma and multiple ring enhancing lesion in HIV is for more or less, it will indicate toxoplasma, okay? Mycobacterium avium intracellulary, MAC, will cause fever, night sweats, weight loss. This is not high yield, so we won't worry about this. And toxoplasma will cause multiple ring enhancing lesion. We already talked about this. So these are the findings that are high yield. And the one which we have put the star marks on are definitely going to be tested, definitely, definitely. Okay. Mm. Okay. So findings, focus on the findings. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Now, last one of today's um, virology after this will be done with virology, that is prions, okay? What are prions? Okay, prion. prions are, can you show the stars? Yes, okay. If you are done, please say done so that I can move on. If After you have identified the stars, please say done in the chat box. Done or not done? Can I move on? Everyone else, can I move on? Okay. Prions, what are prions? 
Prions are basically accumulation of a type of protein which cannot be broken down by proteases. If I talk about accumulation of a type of protein which cannot be broken down by proteases, what are what is the other type of uh, disease where there is this sort of a pathogenesis? Fast answers, please. Accumulation of a protein which cannot be broken down by a protease. Amyloidosis, very good. Very good, okay, very proud of you guys. So in amyloidosis, you have amyloids, a certain form of an amyloid protein which will go and deposit in different parts of the body that will not be broken down by the proteases. The same thing is that with this one, prions are caused by the conversion of a normal protein, which is alpha helico, termed prion protein, to a beta pleated form. That is PRPC is the normal one, but it's converted to BRPSC. So this is transmitted via CNS-related tissue, via iatrogenic crucifield Jacob disease, or food contaminated with BSE infected animal product, which is a variant form of Hootsville Jacob disease. Now, this resists protein degradation and facilitates the conversion of more PRPC to PRPSC. Now, if you have an organ where extreme amount of protein is being accumulated where that cannot be broken down by proteases, will that organ work fine or will it fail? Fast answers. Very easy rhetorical question. Fail. Okay, so that's why it's a problem. Over here, this organism, prion proteins, they enter the body in crucial Jacob disease, for example, via either they can have iatrogenic, that is from the hospital, they can have infections or via uh, food related, uh, food contamination with BSE infected animal product. Resistant to, start, uh, to standard sterilization procedures, meaning that in by autoclaving, you cannot break down the prions. So accumulation of PRPC results in the spongiform encephalopathy and dementia ataxia and death. Hootsville Jacob disease is, is rapid progressive dementia. So typically it's a sporadic form. So over here, you see spongiform, sponge-like appearance of the parenchyma of the brain. So spongiform encephalopathy. This is high yield. And Hootsville Jacob disease is also called this is rapidly progressive dementia, and typically it's a sporadic form. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy is also called mad cow disease. Over here, you also have accumulation of prions in different tissues, and that causes the disease. Another one is known as kuru. Kuru is basically, it's the, it's the disease that happens in certain tribes where human cannibalism is practiced. That is, humans eat other humans. Obviously, if you have a prion, now if I come and eat you, then I will also have your prion, so as simple as that. So it's basically a food contamination. Another one is um, via iatrogenic form. Now, your assembly step one questions, how are they going to come? They are going to come in the form of ataxia, dementia, and the dementia is rapidly progressive. Along with this, they can have the mention of spongiform encephalopathy. If they mention ataxia, dementia, and the presence of spongiform encephalopathy like presentations on an imaging, then which disease are they talking about? They're talking about Crutzfeld Jacob disease, CJ disease. Okay, so prions. That's that. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. So with that being said, we are done with virology. Okay, so with that being said, we are done with virology. Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay. Okay, good. Now, next one. Next one is microbiology systems. Okay. Microbiology systems is basically purely Okay, I apologize, but that is exactly what it is. There is nothing I can tell you to do otherwise except memorize this. Right now, the fact that Staph epidermidis is in the skin and Staph aureus is in the nose, did we discuss this in the previous lectures of Staph and epidermidis, yes or no? Okay, then the fact that Bacillus cereus causes reheated rice syndrome and food poisoning, did we discuss this in the previous topics? Yes or no? 
and Clostridium botulinum happens from honey. We discussed this, right? Okay. So microbiology systems, these informations over here, they are exceptionally high yield, but are they your primary source of study or should they be used for revision? Which one? Revision, okay. Should they be used for revision? And the answer is yes, they should be used for revision. But with that being said, there are a lot of questions that will come from over here. So do you, do you guys think, for example, bacterial vaginosis, trichomonas and candida, did we talk about them step-by-step step in all the different ones, right? We talked about Gardenella, we talked about trichomonas. So talking about these things, once again, do you guys think we should do that or we should skip this and I'll tell you what to do about this or should we read this text by text or should we just move on to antimicrobials? Your choice. Okay, because I personally think that we should, we should skip this for now because there's no point in reading these things because we have already studied about this. We have studied about, for example, epiglottitis, pertussis, pharyngitis, we have talked about these things. So how about we start with antimicrobials and I tell you exactly what to do about this. Yes or no? Guys, any, 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 I need some feedback from you. Okay, now. The way I want you guys to study this, okay? The way I want you guys to study this, um, in the Facebook discussion group that we have, okay? Are we all active in the Facebook discussion group? Yes, okay. So if possible, you guys are more than welcome to study this by yourself, okay? meaning that all you have to do is go through them. I don't, I, I, I really do not expect you guys to memorize this because there's nothing much to memorize this. If you just go through them step by step in your alone time, then you'll realize that you have, you know, most of the high yield stuff. Okay. But the Facebook discussion group, which we use, the best thing to study microbiology system is in groups of two. More than two is a party. Okay, so groups of two. So two people, if you guys need study partners, just ask someone in the Facebook discussion group if they're willing to participate with you. So the thing is every day for like, or any one day, just take one hour of your whole day. Okay, since all of you have Zoom, use the Zoom and just the way we try to learn, right? You guys can use this to learn about the um, organism. So the way, for example, you know, do you do you guys realize the way I ask you guys questions? Yes or no? Do you guys realize the way I ask you questions? If out of the two people, if anyone can ask the other one the questions in the same way, then we can be done with microbiology systems instead of studying this right now. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so I advise you guys to study this in groups of two, so two people together. Study this in groups of two. If, if needed, use the Facebook discussion group to um, use or find a study partner with whom you can study this. And I will test you guys about this microbiology system on Friday. Okay, we'll have an entire segment where we, we will talk about these things okay are we clear are we clear about this yes or no okay i'll ask you guys about this on friday so this is your homework for the next two or three days okay is that fair or not fair or do you guys want me to read this right now no problem, I'm very open to having feedbacks. Okay. I, I just need your feedbacks, please. Who, who, what, what do you guys think? Is that a good idea or not a good idea?
Okay. Okay. So with that being said, we want to start talking about antimicrobials and antibiotics. Are we ready to do this or do we need a small break before we begin antimicrobials? Everyone, do we need, I need some feedbacks and answers from you. Do we need a break or should we begin this right now? How long do you guys want to take the break for? Five minutes. Okay, that sounds good. So let's take a break for five minutes. Let's come back at 1217 and let's start with antimicrobials, one of the most highest yield topics for step one, okay?
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So first and foremost, let me congratulate you for finishing microbiology, except the fact of reading microbiology systems, which we have to uh, study at home because it's a revision topic. We studied most of the high yield things. So don't forget to do that if you need help use the Facebook discussion group to take the help of a friend, okay? If needed, form a group of two people and you guys can finish it way faster and more effectively, okay? So right now we are going to talk about antimicrobials. Most importantly, which we will be talking about is antibiotics. Antibiotics, the mechanism of action of antibiotics is one of the most highest yield things. And this small simple diagram is all we need to understand how the antibiotics are, are, are working over here. Next thing we have to know is after understanding the mechanism of action, we have to understand the adverse effects. And trust me, it looks pretty difficult and complicated at first, but with everything with the mechanism of action and adverse effects of the drugs and the drugs, it will be very easy to do this, okay? So this is basically what I'm trying to draw over here for the past one minute is I'm trying to draw uh, bacteria, okay? So just give me one more second, one second. Okay. Okay, now, <clears throat> now, the first thing that I wanna talk about, okay, the first, thing that I want to talk about is first group of antibiotics that I want to talk about are the, one of the most common antibiotics that is penicillins and cephalosporins. Okay. Is everyone with me? Are we ready to begin to talk about the mechanism of actions of the antibiotics? Please put your attention to this. Okay. So this is the structure of a bacteria. As a matter of fact, you can see over here that it's a small piece of protein trying to be synthesized by the ribosomes 50S and 30S. These are the two ribosomes of bacteria. Over here, we have the DNA and two enzymes. We have DNA gyrase over here, and we have RNA polymerase over here trying to prescribe, trying to make the mRNA, and the DNA gyrase is responsible for, for DNA replication. So two processes happening simultaneously. And we need the tetrahydrofolate to make the DNA components. So para-aminobenzoic acid is converted to dihydrofolate and dihydrofolate is converted to tetrahydrofolate. So we, this is the whole procedure that's happening in a normal bacteria as of right now. Okay, now, organism-wise, um, we have gram positives and gram negatives, so we're not gonna focus on that one right now. We're going to talk about in the different regions of this bacteria, what are the antibiotics that can work? So first structure over here, as you can see, the outer covering is the cell wall. And in the cell wall, we have a very high yield substance that we talked about in the past, that is the sugar backbone peptidoglycan. 
in which in which types of grams do we have a thicker gram uh, peptidoglycan and where do we have a thinner peptidoglycan? I need some fast answers, please. Thick peptidoglycan in. Gram positive, very good. Gram positive have thick, gram negative have thin. Now, peptidoglycan cross linkage. This is the peptidoglycan cross linkage, okay? Peptidoglycan cross linkage. What are the antibiotics that will target the peptidoglycan? Very simply put, the antibiotics that will target over here are your penicillins, right? Then cephalosporins, okay? Cephalosporins, penicillin, and we have another group of uh, antibiotics. Basically, they still fall under penicillins. That is, you have some penicillins which are sensitive to penicillinase, and you have some penicillins which are not sensitive to penicillinase. So we'll talk about them later. But in a broad classification, the antibiotics are your penicillins and your cephalosporins. That will go and break down the peptidoglycan cross linkage. So that's that. Next one. Next one is one of them will go and break down peptidoglycan cross-linking. Another group of antibiotics will grow down and prevent peptidoglycan synthesis. Another group will prevent peptidoglycan synthesis. Okay, synthesis. Peptidoglycan synthesis will be blocked by glycopeptides. Over here, you have two antibiotics, that is vancomycin. And another one that, we, that you have is bacitracin. Bacitracin and van vancomycin, both of them are known as glycopeptides. Okay, next one. Next one is, so we're going from outwards to inwards. Okay, so first of all, break down the peptidoglycan, penicillin, cephalosporin. Prevent peptidoglycan formation, vancomycin, bacitracin. Next next layer is the cell membrane layer. Okay, cell membrane, antibi uh, cell membrane integrity could be broken down by two cell membrane. I'm just going to write CM over here. Cell membrane can be attacked by two antibiotics. One of them is polymyxine, polymyxines. Another one is daptomycin. Another one is daptomycin. Okay. So that is all for now. Now I'll give you guys one minute to learn this. Okay. For pharma, well, I, I will not give you guys a lot of homework. I'll try to make sure that we learn everything in during the lecture. Okay, so I'll give you guys 1225. I'll give you guys two minutes to learn this. Names of peptidoglycan cross-linking preventers, peptidoglycan synthesis preventers, and cell membrane integrity maintenance preventers. Okay, so these three groups. I'll give you guys two minutes. After that, I'll ask you questions. So you have 1225. I'll give you till 1227. Two minutes, then I'll move forward. Please try to participate. The more you participate, the more chances of you doing well in the exams are there. Even if you make a mistake when you participate, there's nothing to be ashamed about or disappointed of. Because if you make the mistakes now, that's still understandable and acceptable. But if you make the mistakes in the step one exam, then that will be very disappointing. Okay, so please try to participate. I'll, I urge you to participate.
Okay, it's 12.27. So who is ready to participate? Three students, please. Who is ready to participate? Just name the, you have, you, all you have to do is name the drugs. That's all. Dr. Dahlia, okay, two more students who can name the names of the drugs. Dr. Sabira Khatun and another physician who can name the drugs, who can name the drugs. Dr. Lala through chat box. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's ask the names. First of all, what are the names? First question is for Dr. Dahlia. What is the name of the peptidoglycan cross-linking preventers? Uh, penicillin and sivalosporin. Done, thank you. Next one is Dr. Sabira Khatun. What, what are the names of peptidoglycan synthesis preventers? glycopeptides, Which that's are? Vaptomycin and Bacitracin. Vaptomycin and Bacitracin, thank you. Next one is Dr. Lala, through, through the chat box. What are the, what are the names of, um, what are the names of cell membrane integrity preventers? Vaptomycin and polymyxines. Okay, good. Now, next one. Okay, next one. Next one that we're going to do is, we are going to talk about the prevention of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. If we talk about the prevention of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate, first of all, we're going from outward to inward. So we cell wall, cell membrane. Now we'll talk about the folic acid. My question is, if we do not have proper tetrahydrofolate, will we have all the components of the bacterial DNA? Yes or no? No, okay. So if we prevent this, there's a very high yield enzyme that we can prevent that is dihydrofolate reductase, okay? So the ends, uh, there are two types of drugs that we can talk about over here that can help us with this is sulfonamides and sulfonamides and trimethoprene. Sulfonamides and trimethoprene. These are folic acid preventers, okay? Now, next one. Next one that we wanna talk about over here is we want to talk about um, the two enzymes over here, which will be targeted. For example, this is an RNA, po RNA polymerase. The enzyme, the drug that prevents RNA polymerase to act properly, the name of this drug is rifampin. Rifampin. And DNA gyrase inhibitors are very high yield. These are basically fluoroquinolones. Okay, we also have maledixic acid, but that's not very high yield. So fluoroquinolone, I'm just gonna use one, one name so that it's easy for all of us to remember. Next one. Next one is for 50S and for 30S. For 50S and 30S, what we do is um, we use a mnemonic. Okay, does, it, does anyone know the name of the mnemonic? The name of the mnemonic is you buy, buy at 30, you buy something at 30 bucks, and then you sell it, you sell it at 50 bucks. So you make a profit of 20 bucks, basically. So you want to buy something uh, for 30 bucks, for, for $30. And let's say you sell that at for $50. So you make a profit of $20. So buy at 30, sell at 50. At 30 for, at 30 for, at 30 S, we have amino glycosides and we have tetracyclines sell at 50 cell s e l l we will talk about uh, we'll talk about c e l l so we have um, sorry we'll talk about s e l that's true so s we have streptogamins okay streptogamins consist of quinipristine and dalphopristine that's that and then e4 erythromycin which will represent macrolids okay l4 l4 linozolin l4 linozolin and over here, I'll use C again, CNS, okay? C4, um, your C4 chloramphenicol, that's right. Chlorom chloramphenicol and clindamycin, okay? So that's that. So these are the names of all the antibiotics. And over here, there's another one. And another one which we forget <clears throat> as a, I always forget, that is free radical formation, 
okay, free radical formation, for example, superoxide or hydrogen peroxide, we can have an antibiotic which can form free radicals and cause damage to the bacterial integrity. Can you guys name this antibiotic which can form free radicals? Fast answers, please. Metronidazole, very good. Okay, did you guys look at the book and give the answer? No? Okay, I trust you. Buy at 50, sell at 30. At 30, aminoglycoside, tetracycline at 30S. They will work at 30S. Amazons, and sell at 50. S for streptogamins or C for, streptog uh, C for chloramphenicol or clindamycin. E for erythromycin, which will also have azithromycin and clarithromycin, but erythromycin to remember the macrolides. And L for linezolin. So sell at 50, buy at 30, sell at 50. Okay, are we clear? Okay, so how long can I give you guys to remember the names of the, to tell me the names of the drugs? How long do you guys need to read this right now? This is the last topic for today. After this, after this we will end the lecture. We'll start fresh from tomorrow because your response times have gone down considerably low and I do not want to force anything. How long do you guys need? Two minutes for Dr. Hassan. Who else needs more minutes? I need you guys to tell me this or else the lecture will not end. Okay, two minutes, fine. So it's 12.34, uh, I'll ask you at 12.36 and please everyone try to participate, please. I, I, I insist, try to participate. Only the names of the drugs which I have mentioned over here, that's all you need to know, trust me. That's all you need to know for your future understanding of antibiotics from tomorrow. But for today, you have to master at least this, this amount. Okay, I'll ask you at 12.36, I'll give you guys two minutes. Okay, so Dr. Hassam, you ready? Who else is ready? Who else is ready? Dr. Hassan is ready. Okay, Dr. Dahlia is ready. Dr. Khatun is ready. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, my apologies. I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, uh, talking for four hours has a big toll on my vocal cords. <clears throat> okay. So uh, first question, okay. Dr. Hassan, 
what are the names of the antibiotics that will prevent hepatobac and cause linking? Uh, Benicillin and cephalosporin. Okay, what are the names of the antibiotics that will prevent hepatobac and synthesis? Synthesis, um, glyco uh, yeah, glycopeptides. Very good. Okay, what are the names of the antibiotics that will prevent cell mem membrane integrity? Daptomycin. Daptomycin and polymyxines. Okay, very good. Next one is Dr. Hassan. Dr. Hassan, name the antibiotics that would prevent the tetrahydrofolate form formations. Very good. Sulfonamides and trimethoprim. Okay, name. Next one, name the antibiotics that can prevent DNA integrity by forming free radicals. Metronidazole, okay. Next one is Dr. Dahlia. Dr. Dahlia, would you be kind enough to name the antibiotic which prevents the proper action of RNA polymerase? Uh, RNA polymerase is uh, rifampicin. Okay, what are the names of the antibiotic that prevents the proper action of DNA gyrase? Uh, fluoroquinolone. Okay, very good. Next one is Dr. Sabira Khatun. What are the names of the antibiotics that acts on 30S subunit ribosomes? It's aminoglycosides. That's digendamycin, neomycin, amicosin. Good. Those are aminoglycosides. And which other groups? And uh, glycycycline. Nope. Uh, glycycycline is not the one which I mentioned. Please don't look at the book. It's by at 30. At 30 is AT, aminoglycoside, and tetracyclines. Do you, you remember by at 30, uh, cell at, by at 30, cell at 50? Yeah, that's for the, you are asking for 30 S. Yes, yeah, it's for 30 S. Yes. I mentioned only two, aminoglycosides and tetracyclines. Oh. Aminoglycosides and tetracyclines. So thank you so much for participating, Dr. Sabir okay. Akhadun. Next one is once again, okay, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Nuseb Ahmed, what are the antibiotics that work at 50 S? Chloramphenicol, erythromycin, erythromycin, linozolid, linozolid, and it's four streptogamins. Right? Yes or no? S four streptogamins? Yes. Okay, so that's all. So thank you so much. So that's the broad classification of one of of only the high yield antibiotics. Not all the one, only the high yield antibiotics. Okay. So with that being said, can we end the lecture over here uh, for first aid today? Yes or no? And we can start fresh tomorrow morning with the antimicrobials. Everyone? Yes? Okay. In the meantime, do you have to study the microbiology systems? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so uh, we are going to end the lecture over here for today. Uh, from tomorrow, we are going to start the lecture and once we finish antimicrobials, we'll start doing the questions once again from microbiology. In the meantime, uh, are you guys doing questions from microbiology already? Yes or no? Are you guys doing questions from microbiology? Okay. So from today, since we are done with microbiology, after you guys are done studying bio virology, can we start with the questions of microbiology? Okay. So let's start with the questions of microbiology very quick uh, because there's a lot of questions in UWorld which we want to get ahead of. So let's start with that, okay? So with that being said, we are going to end the lecture over here for us today. Um, uh, you have you guys have finished virology. We have already started antimicrobials. Hopefully tomorrow we'll be done with antimicrobials, and then we can move on to pathology and pharmacology and get done with our state as a whole. Okay. <clears throat> can we have the recording sooner? As I missed the first pass. Yes, I'll try to send out the recording as soon as possible. Okay. So with that being said, can we end the lecture over here? Okay, so you're welcome. Thank you so much for attending the lecture. 
Um, if you guys have any questions or recommendations, please send us an email or feedback. We would highly appreciate it. If you guys um, have any questions, once again, send us an email and we'll, we'll answer it for you. And I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. Once again, don't forget to do your homework. Don't forget to start with the questions. That's all. Okay. And thank you so much. And it has been an absolute pleasure. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m.